Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks.
Barry, can you heal us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yep. Barry, can you heal us? I was visiting Frank and it's Welcome. We are here on March 11, 2004. The time is 5.30 p.m. Address 10 West State Street and we're at the City Hall Council Chambers for a regularly scheduled uh, City Council meeting. Let's call the meeting to order and then stand for the pledge after that. I, I, I mean, call the meeting to order. I'm sorry. I should do one thing at a time. Um, oh, let's do the pledge first. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I was supposed to start a jury trial tomorrow at 8.30 in, morning, in the morning. I should be used to this sort of thing. It would be objection, compound, question, or instruction. All right, roll call. Hoop? Here. Cal? Here. Lottie Huff? Here. Mitchell? 
Here. Nichols? Here. Schneider? Here. Thompson? Here. Very good. Now it is time for the public comment, and I have to read this advisory that you, as members of the public, may make comments on any item that is not on the agenda. Approach the mic, state your name and address, and limit your comments to three minutes unless you are authorized uh, by the mayor to speak longer. Uh, direct your comments to the mayor and council as a whole, and the mayor and I may not engage in discussion of or debate on items raised by members of the public, and no action be, be taken on those items raised in public comments in order that we comply with open meetings laws. At one of the recent meetings, a uh, person got up and was asking questions and was offended not to get a response. Well, we can't respond. That's why this advisory is given to you. It's written. You can read it. Uh, it's posted. Uh, but it is now time that anybody who wishes to uh, address us can speak, uh, approach the mic. My name is Jimmy Lee Lant. I live at 610 North 4th Avenue. I've been up here for a month and a half working, trying to get this thing resolved on these cars and trucks and garbage and everything else around this town. What upsets me, Mr. Mayor, is that back about six years ago, you guys tried to ticket me for a frame, and El Hoop can remember, he was sat right over there at the time. You're actually not supposed to address people by name, uh, specific counselors. Okay. I just read that to you, Okay. Sir. Well, anyhow, I'm working on this truck, and it's a rolling frame in and out of my garage, changing chassis on it. Nooses officer come down, gave me 72 hours to get it out of there, and I was mowing under it, doing everything the right way, but it wasn't optimal. And he gave me 72 hours. I said he's going to have it hauled away, and I was going to get fine. And at that time, the person I referred to will vouch that I tried to pour a cement slab there to make it legit that it was on a hard surface, and it still wouldn't buy into it. I know that you can't respond to the questions, but... When can you respond to things if it never gets put on here? And another thing is, why don't we consider putting these public comments at the end of the meeting so you can respond to the questions during the meetings? Why, it used to be that it was behind the meeting. All of a sudden, now it's at the beginning of the meeting. So, I... I just, I just want to hear some answers from you guys, and I'm not hearing nothing. Get frustrated, and you start losing your temper. That's all I got to say. Can, can you can't dress it again? Not until mayor or uh, council of comments. What does it take to get my stuff on here? What does it take? I got a. What are you smiling about? You, I got to hire a lawyer. Because I can't talk and answer your questions. I got to hire a lawyer to, to present this, or what? Anyone else? Alan Kent, six twelve North Fourth Avenue. Mister Lant just brought up something that reminded me of. An incident here in town. I uh, used to own Kent's Towing, and I put the building up on North 3rd Avenue just before you cross the river bridge. I had five cars that had caught fire on the west side of that building. Couldn't be seen. But the city sent me a letter stating they were going to fine me $100 a day per car till I moved them. What I don't understand is... I hear you guys have to run through a lot of hoops to get this done, but I don't believe you jumped through any hoops to find me for cars. That's all I have to say. I just I want to get something done about this, and I don't see any action. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Joe, Joe Carter, 610 Elmwood Drive. <clears throat> I'm going to change it up a little bit. 
uh, and talk about something different. A few weeks ago uh, at one of the council meetings, uh, there was some discussion or a question about uh, uh, nonprofits and the assets that they had. And I know that's been a, a discussion point of uh, uh, other people in the past. <clears throat> I just want to say that Marshalltown, the community, is so fortunate that we have so many nonprofits, but those nonprofits take on such a wide range, and my data may be a little bit out of date. I picked up something on the internet uh, this morning uh, just to give me some general idea, but the Animal Rescue League uh, is a not for profit, and they have, according to this uh, site, $1.7 million in assets. I don't, I don't think that uh, should surprise anybody uh, that they have a lot of assets, they have a building, they have property, uh, they, have, uh, they need to have assets to be able to run their organization. But we wouldn't expect them to spend all of their money, uh, boom, and be gone, and then, and then they're done. If they have no assets, they can't run, they can't do the job that they're supposed to do. But Area 6 is on there, Center Associates, uh, I think we probably need them around rather than just spending their assets. Uh, Searcy, Consumers Energy is a not-for-profit that would show up on that list. But I think the specific question was asked about uh, the Fisher family or a Fisher Trust, I don't remember exactly which one it was, that had $5 million. And I think we are so blessed to have the Fisher family do what they did. Uh, it's so easy for all of us to take our money, invest it in the stock market or invest it in our 401ks and not contribute back to our community. But that family did a lot for this, or for this community. Uh, it continues to do that and they're under certain obligations as a not-for-profit to not just spend out those assets. Uh, that night it was noticed that uh, the uh, uh, paintings that we've got, the Impressionist paintings we've got are worth something in excess of $5 million all in amongst themselves. If we don't do something with those assets, if we don't uh, uh, take care of those uh, paintings that we've got and make a better community, shame on us because I think that family uh, left us many other good things. And then I'm, uh, I'm pleased to say that Marshalltown Company is still a family-owned organization and it was nice to see on that list the Ann Kaiser Trust. Uh, Ann's husband, John, was a longtime uh, uh, um, member of our uh, business and uh, she has contributed back to this community and done so many good things and we're just blessed is what I want to say uh, that this community has so many of those good people who have done those sort of things so thank you thank you anyone else hi Alice Quested 2443 Smith Avenue I realize I live outside the city limits but I've worked downtown for the last 25 years, and I've been a part of a lot of different organizations. Right now, I'd like to just bring everybody's um, attention to, we've had things brought up about not being clean in the city. Well, Cleaniac hopes to change things, as we do every year. We are having a three weekends where we're going to attack the streets, the parks, and different areas around town uh, with different groups adopting these areas. We have assistance with Emerson, Marshalltown Company, Mechdyne, First Interstate Bank, Park and Rec Community, elementary schools. There's a whole variety. I know that the 13th Street District also does their own cleanup. The downtown has a cleanup set up, and Marshall County Conservation is now cleaning up. It's all a part of Earth Day taking pride in our community and making sure that everything looks great. So if you want to be a part of this, and I invite everybody that's listening, if you want to be a part of Cleaniac, we do have April 13th, 20th, and 27th. We will be doing things as an organization, or if you just want to take a walk around town, because today is a beautiful day, and you want to pick up a bag of trash, we'd be much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia Raglan, 1502 West Lincoln Way, and I just want to piggyback on what Alice and Joe just said. In addition to the many assets that we have with our nonprofits, um, we didn't totally touch on volunteers and people, and I think we're very blessed in Marshalltown to have so many people that care about our community and are working so hard in quiet ways to get things done as they can, and um, I just think we need to be appreciative of that. And I think that we can look to Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes 
because she has really taught me even more than ever that it takes a team. It can't be one individual or one group doing everything. And so it takes every one of us working together and supporting each other every day. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to piggyback on the last three, Neil DeLaw, 1504 Brentwood Terrace. You don't have to be in an organization or an event to clean up, right? You can go outside right now, clean up on your own time, on your own schedule. We did it yesterday on a walk with my daughter and my wife and mother-in-law before the Iowa Hawkeye game, right? So you don't need to be a part of an event. It's great that you are, but after the three weekends for uh, Cleaniac, keep it going, right? Grab a bag, walk around, and pick up trash. That's the best thing we can do on your own time. You don't have to ask anybody either. Thanks. Thank you. Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. So we had a good election. Elections can be fun. They can not be fun. Sometimes we get all involved in the election, and some people say things they shouldn't say. Sometimes they border on slander and libel, and that's, those are two legs of defamation of character, which we should be careful to avoid. I just think we should, when we're coming to a, uh, a, another election, I think uh, if we can get more people involved, that would be great. We've had as many as 3,000 people vote. Unfortunately, only 1,500 people showed up this election, but it's better than nobody. Thanks. My name is Dave Grieve, uh, 24 West Main Street, Apartment 1. Uh, Class 82 Bobcat uh, left the town in 1985 after two years of Marshtown Community College. It's been 40 years, but I'm finally making it back. Um, hopefully end this on a bit of a bright note. Um, I'm happy to say I'm coming in and back into town to invest in the town. And I have a young couple I'm tickled pink to invest in to keep the Dudas Diner running. And hopefully, as John Hall says, we need more cool stuff. I'm going to wake up the Oddfellows Hall for a fun entertainment venue. So more to come, but uh, I thought I'd come and introduce myself. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Very good. Time for the uh, council uh, administrator and uh, mayor comments. Let's go with council first. You're on, if I may. You may. Um, just to point out, um, you are on the agenda, Jimmy. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the agenda, it says parking rules. Um, we're going to be talking about backyard parking, that kind of thing. It's probably not going to address everything that you're um, – wanting to do, but this is part of uh, the city staff coming up with different changes, different ideas, um, bringing it to us so that we can look through it, and you're more than welcome to make comments during the discussion. Any other council comments? I just want to say welcome, Dave. Welcome back to Marshalltown, and I think you picked a wise choice to invest in Marshalltown. <laughs> Anyone else up here? Or on the phone. Your Honor, if I may. You may. Um, just want to follow up with something that got mentioned about picking up garbage. You don't have to have a bag when you go for a walk. You can just throw everything in my yard like all my neighbors do. <laughs> so <laughs> my address is posted. So feel free and I'll pick it up from there. So you don't have to carry a bag with you. Thanks, Your Honor. Oh, you don't know how many people might take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else up here or on the phone here? Okay, good, my turn, and I can reply. Actually, I think you got a notice, didn't you, about a property that, uh, and, and you're turning it into a, a community garden is what you're actually doing with the yard there, so, uh, you know, that, that's commendable. Um, you for throwing trash in? Yeah. Once I, yeah. Once I get the title, yes, you can throw trash in that one, too. And we are uh, we are also working diligently, we being the city staff and I, and our uh, uh, contract employee who is de the de facto city administrator, uh, uh, working very closely with the staff after years of experience here and with the Iowa League of Cities. 
And uh, one of the things we're doing is trying to figure out who should be supervising whom and replacing the position that Michelle Spahnheimer had. Uh, the current thought is that we may uh, be moving a department over to a different uh, department and that we'll have a new person coming in, maybe an assistant city administrator to handle some of the housing and maybe some of the planning things that are going on and that uh, may or may not include the nuisance enforcement things, still looking at the staff uh, issues there. And then even at the end of the meeting when we used to have the public comment then, we had the same proviso that we couldn't reply at the, at the end. So it's hard to get answers then. If you really want to get on the agenda, you about have to convince a consular or the mayor to be on the agenda to have a topic raised officially, not just in the uh, public comments. Uh, to piggyback on the uh, cleanup days uh, about Cleaniac, uh, I finally remember John Hermanson coming to the Hughes Grove Neighborhood Association uh, parties. He, he could actually fit in that Cleaniac costume. He was tall and skinny enough to uh, to fit in it, and he would be part of the bike parade that would go around in our historic neighborhood association. And then Dan Ingesser is the guy that's been kind of Mr. Kleniak after that. And uh, I get texts from Dan every time there's an Iowa State game. But any time the town is being cleaned up, he's out there uh, leading the charge and looking for volunteers. And so I get to announce that the city cleanup day is on May 18. Uh, that's the one where the city staff uh, makes things available for uh, uh, cleanup. And that includes things like a hazard, hazardous household hazardous drop-off at the Water Pollution Control Building. That's from 8 until 11 in the morning on that Saturday. Uh, the junk drop drop off is at Ruby Boo Park from 8 to 11. And then the compost facility will be uh, open and free that day uh, with the hours at 8 o'clock to 4 p.m. So today when we hit, I think my thermometer said 60, 76 degrees, it was a wonderful day to be outside, a little windy. But if we got it, if we can uh, you know, mobilize all the people that really care about this town, we can really clean the town up. Uh, I would like to mention that the town looked pretty good this last weekend. We had another big event, uh, people coming into our Y here. The Convention and Visitors Bureau does a really nice job of uh, welcoming people into town, and we, we do attract a lot of uh, people to come here. Uh, with that said, uh, one other thing I'd like to do is uh, to um, uh, refer some of my time over to Heather to give everybody what I would give, except she knows it better, um, an update on the State Street Construction Project. Heather? Good evening, Heather Thomas, Public Works. Um, as we have council meetings in this building and we're open for business, um, we have construction that's planning on kicking off here very soon. And we are in the phase three of the State Street project. So we were not shut down last year in front of um, our facilities here, but we will this year. Uh, so the contractor is planning on closing the stretch out here in front of City Hall and Park and Rec um, along State Street on Sunday, March 17th. Um, so I want to just provide an update to everybody on the planned construction. I have that up on the screen right now. Uh, we are going to make an effort to keep the sidewalk on this side of the street open as long as possible. So you guys are still able to access the park and rec door, um, either coming from the east or west. Um, also, um, when practical and possible, we're also going to be keeping a gravel access path open from the parking lot across the road over to the park and rec entrance. So if you come to council meetings, um, you're still able to park across the road and come over here. Uh, again, it's going to be a gravel access path. So if you have mobility concerns, please park on Center Street or the Coliseum parking lot. And then you'll be able to use the sidewalks to keep hard surface. Um, if there's any questions or more mobility concerns, please reach out to us. We will do what we can to make sure you're able to attend these meetings in person, um, both city council meetings and other business that you may have at City Hall. Uh, the City Hall main entrance on Center Street will remain open for business just like it is today, um, but we'll have to be a little bit flexible and patient as construction goes on with the park and rec entrance. So uh, construction, again, kicking off March 17th in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate that. Uh, and before calling for a motion on the consent agenda, too, I want to comment about Dudas and the Odd Fellows. If you weren't able to make it to the tour of treasures the two times or three times that uh, every other year you've been able to see what that facility is like upstairs, it is really neat. I mean, it's one of the neatest things I've seen in the town of Marshalltown. Uh, the other one is being fixed up uh, where the chamber is, and uh, and there could be living spaces now above it. Those were, those were two of the most 
fascinating things that I've ever seen on the tour. So it's exciting to have somebody come in and uh, take over a building like that. Uh, if you'd like to ad address it, come on up. You're still on my time, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear. Uh, yeah, the the hall is amazing. It has 20 foot ceilings. There's a stage and a, a balcony and everything. And I didn't know much about the Odd Fellows until I saw the building. But what they stand for and what they do is amazing. And there is five remaining Odd Fellows left in Marshalltown. At one point, there was 1,800 members. And uh, I'm meeting up with them on Thursday, and I've also talked to the organization in Des Moines, the Master Lodge, and I am seeing these Odd Fellow Halls crop up all over the nation because it's what they stand for, and the youth are very energetically in getting involved. So more to come on that, but it's more than just an entertainment venue I'm looking for. It's also to help resurrect what the Odd Fellows stand for. So it is amazing up there in the... It's incredible. So, it is. Yeah. The, the balcony. I, is I may be cool. doing tours here shortly <laughs> oh, as yeah. I hang out at Odd Fellows. Really, it's yeah. that cool. Yeah. So, okay. yes. Thank good. you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate any investment in this town. All right. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Nobody removed anything from it? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Hoop? Yes. yes. Kel? Yes. Bodyhoff? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Very good. That carried. And you don't have to read them anymore. They're published and online. On to reports, the first one of which is, and the only one of which is, an impact quarterly update report. Good evening, David Hicks, YSS of Marshall County, here to talk a little bit about impact. But first, Joe Carter, thank you for the shout outs about nonprofits. We do a lot of great work in this community, and I'm happy to be part of a tremendous nonprofit such as uh, YSS. So, talking about impact, I uh, want to inter quickly introduce our, our newest impact advocate, Tiffany Beadle, waving in the back there. Uh, she joins uh, Susie Reed, as we have two impact advocates, those are the two social workers that are embedded within the Marshalltown Police Department, responding to those numerous uh, non-criminal calls. So uh, some stats from uh, last calendar year, 2023, uh, the team responded to 362 calls involving 801 contacts. Uh, in addition, uh, some prevention work being done. Uh, 506 follow-ups with 941 contacts. That's a 38% increase than the previous year of 22 and a 40% increase in follow-ups. So I, I think we're seeing that the follow-ups are really uh, starting to deter some of those frequent 911 calls that happen on a regular basis. So uh, looking back again into last year, 93% of the officers returned to the field after that initial call as that was one of our goals to put uh, police officers back on the streets, saving their time and energy. Uh, our peak calls in 2023, uh, May, June, July, and August, they range from anywhere from 40 to 44 calls uh, during that time. I guess summertime is just uh, uh, goes with the territory when you have kids out of school. And uh, uh, obviously uh, just changes in schedule. So uh, mental health and homelessness remain the top two calls we're responding to uh, last year, and that continues that trend January and February of this uh, calendar year. Uh, of the calls we've responded to this uh, year, January and February, 38% uh, regarding homelessness, 15% uh, mental health, 15% juvenile issues. So right there alone, that's about 70%. Um, what we've also been doing is monetizing some of our data. So if we're preventing a, a visit to the ER, what does that look like dollar-wise? So uh, we did kind of did some research, you know, to darken an ER's doorstep. $2,500, give or take. Uh, so far, we've prevented four ER visits, behavioral health related. So we've uh, provided some wraparound services for them. So that saved about $10,000. Uh, so far, January and February, we've also deterred some arrests. Uh, those arrests, um, a squatter in a house, not supposed to be there. Uh, some people trespassing, looking for occupancy in businesses and apartments and houses they're not welcome at. So instead of uh, an arrest, impact is called, we start working with that individual or family on some housing needs. So um, we're doing some great work, but, but one thing I want to uh, at least keep on the radar here, our funding uh, initially was one year 
uh, and I remember Gary saying, don't come back because uh, that won't be there. So uh, Chief Tupper and myself, we've uh, taken care of some grants, Department of Justice grants, some other grants as well. So we have funding right now through December of 2026. So I don't want to say we're on the clock, but we're on the clock. Uh, to sustain this, we're going to have to figure out what, what the funding looks like. Uh, this is a proven program, uh, great data. Uh, we're saving some lives, saving some time, and that was the original goal. So uh, we're going to keep our eyes out for some dollars, maybe Department of Justice, uh, maybe some state dollars, but we know that co-responding programs like IMPACT, uh, the future is now. Uh, other programs across the country are looking at us on how we do things, uh, but the funding has to walk uh, uh, hand in hand with our programming and, and being able to stick around past 2026. So a year from now, uh, I know budgets will be, be looking at for that 2026, not that that burden has to fall on the council, uh, but we're going to have to be pretty diverse in how we find those funds to continue impact, which uh, uh, certainly is the pride and joy of, of this partnership between YSS and the Marshalltown Police Department. Questions? Questions, comments up here? Your Honor, if I may. You may. Hey, Dave, clarify your funding through till 2026. Um, that's fiscal year for us or? It'd be calendar year. Oh, yeah. We look at calendar year. So we, uh, you know, we've got ARPA funds in there, and then we're getting Department of Justice grants that we put in there that kind of push push the funding out a little bit further. So and then the thing I wanted you to clarify is that's at your current staffing level, correct? Correct. correct. So you still want to grow this so you can do 24-hour service, right? That would be ideal, but that costs uh, more money. But um, just to maintain status quo, we always look at about 150,000 a year. Um, and we're starting to monetize our, our data here so we can provide some uh, some savings for those who think in terms of money over people. But uh, YSS, we, we look at uh, uh, families we're getting connected to mental health, substance abuse, housing, all those things that make Marshalltown a great place to live uh, through impact we're able to connect people with services. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Your Honor. Thank you. Anyone Thank you all. Up here? Question, Dave. Do you have yeah. some kind of like hour count or something of what this is saving the police department? That's that's really the tough tough number to figure out. If officer time going back out into the field, an hourly rate, uh, I, I'm not sure. We'd have to get a statistician and a, and uh, an accountant to get involved. Um, there's some savings there. I'm just not sure how to calculate that. If we're deterring arrests. Um, you know, officer time with that, but if somebody is missing their job, loses their job, goes on, uh, has to receive, receive some other benefits because they're no longer employed, there's some savings where, and as well as, as well as a cost. So it's kind of an interesting mathematical dilemma, for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank Any you. Public comment on this one? I just have to say, having been a liaison to your nonprofit corporation years ago for the Community Foundation and going to tour the facility across the street and down a little ways here in State Street in that tiny, cramped quarters you had, it's so nice to see what you've done to the old police building and have so many good people working over there that we couldn't ask for a better neighbor here, truly. So appreciate what you do, and, and it's fun to get your annual report. Thank you. All right, on to our next item, which is ordinances. What's your first one to address tonight? Uh, nope. Uh, did I miss a resolution? Oh, I did, I did, yeah. Nope, sorry, I scrolled down too far. Resolutions, back up. Resolution 2024-051, approving an agreement for the public use of the Marshalltown Arts and Civic Center and authorizing the use of council-designated local option sales tax. I move for the approval, Your Honor. You can Second. figure out what's the. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion on this one. At the February 12th meeting, the council directed staff to bring forward a resolution to establish a new one year agreement with the Marshalltown Arts and Civic Center, providing $100,000 in council designated local option sales tax. Um, this will be for fiscal year 25 for the public use of the Civic Center. Uh, the city previously provided this funding through a designated tax levy, which was eliminated from House File 718. Thank you. Any discussion up here? Any public? Your Honor, yes. if I may. You may. Um, I just want to clarify my position on this. 
I think all the 231 nonprofits in town do a great job, and that includes the Fisher Community Center, or the MAC now. Um, but for me, when it comes down to this, it's since the state eliminated the tax levy, the pass-through to the taxpayers, now it's, it's on us, the council, of how to spend our money. And I'm just going to be honest, um, I look at all 231 nonprofits, and yes, I want to keep the Fisher Community Center here in town. Yes, they do a great job. But from the agreement, what's being offered to the city, to the taxpayers, is a free room for nonprofits to meet in at a cost of $100,000. And so that's where I have a problem because all the library's six meeting rooms are free for nonprofits. We have a room in the Coliseum that is free for nonprofits to meet in. Okay, so it's hard for me to justify to people that call me that I just spent a hundred, I voted to spend a hundred thousand dollars for a for a eighth meeting room, and I just can't do that. And it and it's it's hard for me to say that this nonprofit is more deserving than any other of the other two hundred and thirty nonprofits. So. I'll be voting no on this. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Any other council comments? Time for public comment. Yeah. Your Honor. I'm sorry. So, Miss. Basically, I'd like to so both support and show my concern. So I, I very much am a supporter of the Marshtown. I'm not here. Somebody needs to use our mic. Oh. Uh, very much a supporter of the Mar Marshall Town Arts and uh, Civic Center, but the issue is as a private entity and the city have a limited funds What of our valuable? nonprofits should we fund and what are You know as a citizen I need to support the nonprofits I support and the citizens of Marshalltown have shown they stepped up in a big ways many a time to support those which is why we have so many in our community so from my perspective, it's really not the city's job from taxpayers to finance nonprofits. It is my job as a citizen to finance the nonprofits. Other council comment? Not for me. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, w this past weekend we've contacted uh, artists and musicians from uh, the Chicago area. And they've given us many ideas how we can teach people to fish so that they can go and fish for them. And uh, as well as the uh, band. We talked to a band instructor with uh, a municipal band. And uh, their projects made $70,000 and they fund themselves. So I think if we, we can get on the stick here and we can uh, do fundraisers and put skin in the game for the people, that would be best for Marshalltown. So my vote will be no. Other council comment? Your Honor? Yes. I'd just like to say the MAC is a unique resource that Marshalltown has. Uh, it's in its rebirth phase. Uh, it'd be very foolish for us not to support it. I'll be voting yes. Other council comment? Time for public comment. Joe Carter, 610 Elmwood Drive. I didn't think I'd be talking about this tonight. Uh, didn't know how much uh, comment would be made, but uh, I think uh, as we discussed a few weeks ago, uh, you see the uh, beautiful art that's there. I even commented on that tonight uh, and, and what was given by the Fisher family. I, I get it that the uh, state legislature decided to make some changes and put some tough things on us. I think the MAC only asked for a one-year agreement. Uh, isn't it time for us to step forward and go ahead and take care of a situation where yeah, maybe we can uh, get them to fish uh, later on, uh, but I, I, you know, there's limited resources, and uh, and I think we've got the ability to go ahead and take care of this uh, with the council tonight. So I hope your votes will be yes. Karen Gregory, and I am the president of the MAC. Um, I think that one of the telltale signs that this community supports the MAC is that 
they contributed over $3 million to renovate this facility. That isn't operational. That's to bring it back. Clearly, they wanted this facility to continue and to serve this community. Total, we raised $7 million. That included um, a grant from the Martha Allen Tye Foundation and insurance. It also entailed volunteers from this community, 100% volunteer-led, a total renovation, this $7 million renovation. This community, I don't know how much more this community could shout their support for the continuation of the MAC. These are your constituents. Thank you. Lee Botter, 401 Orchard Drive. Uh, to elaborate a little bit on what uh, Councilman Mitchell said, um, I look forward to whichever way the vote goes to stepping up and be part of the unity that we need in community to work for some of those ideas on promotion. Um, the individuals that we had a chance to talk to, um, he is a well-known artist in the Chicago area and shared just kind of an overview of the concerns. And he said, hey, have you tried this idea? Have you tried this idea? Perhaps they have, I don't know, but that's something that I think that we need to sit down as a group and talk over uh, in respect to the band. Um, the band and the individual, he was a retired attorney. He is now a, um, a substitute, does band substitution. His community band, he actually goes in, he likes to substitute because he recruits the seniors in high school to become part of the community band. And the small activity that they did, which I'm going to uh, challenge Thompson, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Mitchell to take a hit on this. They did a roundup program and they raised $73,000 and a community of 8,700. That was done in one month. They used the amounts that they needed for the band, which was about $10,000. Then the balance went to doing scholarships at the local community college. I think that's really a worthwhile concept and so we were trying to draw from some of the experiences of other people let's not reinvent the wheel let's work together and become unity within our community thank you uh, Cynthia Raglan 1502 West Lincoln Way um, I loved that unity in our community and as a member of the board for the MAC, I want you each to know that we are listening to what you're saying and your concerns. And we've been working very hard. And just a reminder that we will continue to work hard, but we do need this for survival at this point. So none of us want an empty, grassy area on that important corner. And we want a home we can all be proud of for an amazing art collection that we're lucky to have. And yeah, there's great things to come. We need your help now. I'm David Clark, 1111 West State. Um, this last weekend I volunteered. There was a funeral celebration of life at the MAC. And it was really fun for me to hear people coming back to Marshalltown who hadn't been to Marshalltown for a long time sharing their memories of what the Fisher Community Center meant to them, now the MAC. Um, people from North Liberty, Waterloo, remembering when they did uh, their art displays and, as students. And they were all very impressed with the facility that we have. I feel like um, the support from the City Council will continue to allow us to have a facility that people not only in Marshalltown, but people who have roots and ties to Marshalltown, and think about coming back to Marshalltown to invest in Marshalltown, we'll say this is one of the uh, amenities that we have that makes Marshalltown a, a vibrant town. I hope you'll support it. Dave Grieve, 24 West Main, apartment one. I wasn't planning to talk so much today, but uh, uh, I have gone through the MAC here recently on my 
journeys researching the town. It is a fabulous uh, facility. I'm tickled pink that they have done such a great job. And I understand the council's concerns. I'm not going to tell you which way to vote. However, what kind of got me into this town was fundraisers. And I came in a couple years ago and saw the damage of the Dre show. And for a high school reunion, some classmates and I got together and helped raise some money for the Christmas lights for downtown. Didn't do all the work. Uh, the MCBD did a lot of it also. And I'm also working with them for a fundraiser this summer. And not tentative yet, but hopefully we can raise some money for the community band. So, like I said, I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but uh, I'm, I'm a fundraiser guy, so I'm going to help that way. Anyone else? Uh, if I may. Um, I'm going to repeat what I said probably about a month ago which is I believe the Fisher Community Center is a, is a community building. Um, it's an iconic building in Marshalltown, uh, and it was built by Bill Fisher. How many thousands of people have been employed, Jamie, by Bill Fisher? 34 and a half years there. Yep. We remember Bill and what he'd done for this town. Thousands of us. Right now, uh, my family... It's my paycheck. What he did, what he started, it means something. This isn't just a building for anything else. You add to it, have an art center that is incredible for a town our size. Incredible when you see the art and the value of it. Bill Fisher means more than a building to this community. You don't get very many Bill Fishers in a town our size at all, at all. And what it meant to Marshalltown, how dedicated he was to Marshalltown. And he built this building and dedicated it to Marshalltown. And I think it'd be a crime if we don't support that building. Now, just a few months ago, John Deere came and had an event in Marshalltown at the Mac Center. And they were impressed. How many times are we going to have people come in, the likes of John Deere, into town? That gives us advantages. Well, you might just want to stick around a little bit. You think this is good? Maybe we could help you get a new uh, building up here. It's economic development, and it makes people proud in this town. So I will be voting yes on this. I encourage the other councilors to do so, too. Um, there was only but one Bill Fisher. Thank you. <clears throat> Could I throw some out? You sure may. I'm just going to throw something at you, Mike. If if all that you said is is real, and I worked at Fisher's forever, my dad did. My two sons are. Why did we change the name from Fisher? community center to something that somebody's going to walk into town and say, where's, where's the Fisher Community Center at? Well, it don't exist anymore. Well, the, um, the building was changed. Uh, name was changed by, at the request of the Fisher family. So that wasn't taken from them at all. And Bill Fisher is pretty prominent inside the building. I believe there's big, so it's still... I mean, you could name it Mac, but it's in my head. It's always going to be the Fisher Community Center. And I, I know vicariously because I was involved with the Martha and Ty Foundation for ten years. That uh, Karen Gregory is the expert witness on anything Fisher family, and I know that she contacted the family and got their blessing and approval to do that. So it really is one of those where the family was not only okay with it; they encouraged it. I, I could call Karen up to. Confirm that. Uh, they did. And, and the reason they supported it is because the intention that Bill Fisher had when he donated the building and the art was to provide it to Marshalltown so that it would drive economic development and that it would help actually retain and recruit employees by having this type of a collection speaks volumes about your community. 
And so those were the basic reasons why. When I talked with the family and, and we, we um, talked about changing the name and why we would change the name, it was because it was about Marshalltown. And it was about recognizing and bringing um, these resources to Marshalltown. I hate that, sorry, but that's really distracting. <laughs> um, anyway, um, if you're talking about people outside of Marshalltown and you're saying the Fisher Community Center, nobody relates that to Marshalltown. When you're saying it's the Marshalltown Arts and Civic Center, it's putting Marshalltown on the map. That's driving our economic recognition, our... our, our um, our marketing position, and our economic development. And that is the key resource, or the, tree, the, sorry, the key reason Bill Fisher did this. Now, with the respect of continuing the legacy, that is critical. And we have the Fisher Art Lounge, which is a um, tribute to Bill and his, his uh, gifts to this community, that lounge is right before you go into the Fisher Art Museum. And we promote this facility as the Marshalltown Arts and Civic Center, home of the Fisher Art Museum and the Martha Allen Tye Playhouse, which is our next project. So it, it really, truly came with the blessings and encouragement from the Fisher family but we haven't lost that. In fact, the Fisher alumni presidents who had these uh, businesses throughout the United States came together and they had, again, such respect for Bill Fisher. They donated over $500,000 to this project because they too wanted to honor Bill Fisher with the Fisher Art Lounge. So it, it has been a um, support of not only the family, but all of these business units that, did, that sold Fisher product. Does that answer? You still wanted Fisher Community Center, I know. <laughs> well, so, so, some of us that are 71 and older will still probably, probably. Par pardon me, Joe, but we're still going to call it Marshalltown Trowel <laughs> Company. <laughs> And some of us actually kind of like fake space instead of Mechdyne, but we're getting used to Mechdyne. And we go past the building that now says Emerson, but a lot of us still think of it as Fisher Controls because we grew up with Fisher Controls. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's part of change and growth, I guess. Anyway, thanks for the replies. Anybody else? You want to me? If you may. Yeah, I got a question. Uh, how many local artists have their artwork displayed at the Fisher Community Center? Well, I know our daughter did when she was in school. And it happens a lot. Uh, but yeah, Karen, you can probably answer that. Um, we have, um, Sharon, you want to take it? Well, I just want to Go say, ahead. In April, no, you need to give your address. Oh, Sharon Greer, 420 Hughes Street. I apologize. So in April, 800 or 800 school kids will be doing a special project that we planned, and there'll be over 100 pictures from kids at Lenahan, and that's the most exciting art project that we have going at this particular time. So you can come see that April 18. Two rotating artists. Yeah, we've had two. Oh, yeah, and we had events for two rotating artists that have been in there to um, actually show their, their stuff and sell their stuff. Uh, I think every, has any other counselor who hasn't spoken, does any other counselor wish to speak before we call the roll? Time for the roll. Mitchell? No. Nichols? No. Schneider? Yes. Thompson? No. Hoop? This really tugs at my heart. I got to say no. Cal? Yes. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Okay, that one failed. On to the next item. 
Ordinance 15082 to amend the Code of Ordinances, City of Marshalltown, Iowa, by amending Chapter 53, Stormwater, by amending Sections 53.006, Rate Structure, and Stormwater Rate, third reading. Move, Move for approval. approval. Saul second, Your Honor. And discussion. I'm not. I'm not sure we need discussion, but uh, Heather, you'd probably Sorry, be the logical one. Up and you didn't want me to. So, um, anyways, third reading of the stormwater rate structure. Um, we're going from two dollars. Sorry, four dollars an ERU to four dollars and twenty cents an ERU. Um, for most residential properties, this equals twenty cents a month or two dollars and forty cents a year increase. Thank you. Any council comments or questions? Any public comments on this one? Didn't expect any. Roll call. Nichols? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Kell? Yes. Ladyhoff? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Okay, that one carried. On to number two. Ordinance 15084 to amend the Code of Ordinances, City of Marshalltown, Iowa, Chapter 91, Fire Prevention and Protection, Violation Penalty, First Reading. Uh, Move for approval. Yeah, your thanks. Honor. Yeah, motion for second. 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 Thank you. Discussion now. Good. Ready to go. Uh, this is a amendment to oh, our. Yeah, I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. Sorry, so Josh Warnell, Marshtown Fire, Marshtown. Thank you. Fire. Um, this is amendment to uh, change our municipal infraction in our ordinances. We found out during the mall episode that it was a process to get one of those going and we had to go through our city attorney which cost us roughly five hundred dollars for each municipal infraction to take out what this does is gives us the ability to start that process ourselves so any questions or comments by the council for josh any public comments your honor yes. real, oh. josh what mall issue are you even talking about i don't understand what you're talking about 2500 south center marshtown shopping center i don't think his mic is on excuse me Better. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. I heard you, but I got hearing aids now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other council comments, questions? Any public comment? Roll call. Lottie Hoff? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Kell? That carried on to discussion items, the first of which is the railroad uh, quiet zone or safety known project, safety zone project. I probably should have paid more attention to the title on that one. Good evening, Heather Thomas, Public Works. I'm going to go ahead and open a couple of exhibits up. And then as we're discussing, um, I also do have Greg Broussard with Bolton Mink here um, for some technical questions as you have them. Uh, the city has been working on creating a railroad quiet zone since 2010. Uh, these discussions have uh, came and paused and came and paused um, and was delayed a little bit by the tornado in 2018. Uh, 2019, Council gave direction uh, to go ahead and proceed full forward um, with this project. And then the last presentation and update to Council was in January of 2022. Well, there um, has been some progress, but there's been some stalled progress as well um, over the past two years as we've worked to uh, continue this effort. Um, I do believe that we are in a position where if we continue, um, this is a potential it still can come to fruition uh, we just want to make sure we are able to give you that update of where the project's at and concurrence on the direction that we're headed um, so I'm gonna go through the quiet zone project um, crossing by crossing uh, we have four at grade crossings here in Marshalltown and then give you an update on each of them and kind of the direction that we're needing from council on each of them as well um, so this is the map in front of you. Uh, if the quiet zone is implemented, the uh, purple line would be the line of, quote, the quiet zone. Uh, so that would enable trains to not blow their horns every time they come up to an at grade crossing. They still have the ability to blow their horns if there's something in the way, um, but their standard operating procedure would be to not blow their horns. 
So we're going to start with 12th Street. Uh, this is the most straightforward crossing that we have. Uh, they required us to do some uh, extended raised medians in the center. Um, they also required us to remove a driveway. Um, the property owner at the northwest corner um, was able to go ahead and remove that driveway as part of another project they recently completed. Um, so as far as this intersection goes, this at grade crossing goes, um, we don't need any direction from council. Um, we're sitting pretty good at this intersection with the proposed plan that we've provided. The next one is the 6th Street crossing. And this one has been a little bit more challenging. At the northwest quadrant, there is a commercial warehouse. Um, using my mouse, um, there is a loading dock for a semi-truck semi in this area. It's a little bit different today. This is an older fo photo. Um, but one of the challenges is the railroad would require us to uh, modify that driveway such that this would not be able to be used and backed in with a semi easily. Um, so we've had some discussions. Um, several staff members prior to me have had discussions with this property owner. Uh, this property owner then passed away and it went into a trust with uh, four uh, equal partners um, and, and siblings. Um, we had had some communication and that communication kind of fell off about a year ago. Um, since my memo came out last Thursday, um, I was contacted by one of the, the individuals that I had reached out to about two weeks ago. Um, and he assures us while he's out of town right now, he'll be back in late March and that if the city is going to proceed with this project, he's going to continue to work with the city um, and, and figure out a way to do this. Realistically, what's going to happen is that there's going to probably be a payment from the city to this property owner um, to allow them to get rid of this loading dock and then that would give them the opportunity to relocate this loading dock to another location on the building um, more likely the the north side um, so if we're able to come to terms with that that's likely a fifty to seventy five thousand dollar a project um, to get that loading dock resolution this driveway would be reduced in width and we would be able to proceed um, so coming here, uh, my direction from council I was looking for um, was that you wanted us to continue uh, negotiations with that property owner um, because at the time that I wrote this, this memo, uh, we'd had some difficulties with that discussion um, and needing to know whether we could use an attorney to have those discussions. I feel a little bit better today standing in front of you um, than I did uh, a week ago um, that maybe there's, there's some effort there, but uh, anytime you're in negotiations with a landowner, um, there's a conversation application. Um, so with that, is there any objection from council to go ahead and proceed with continuing discussions with this landowner in the realm of probably a, a payment for, for relocating of the, the loading dock? Any councilor wish to speak on it? So Your Honor, for me. I have a question. It's more of a question on all these. This is really more about safety crossing as much as quiet zone right I mean the sidewalks and that kind of thing improvement it's a combination um, you have a rating and there is a scoring system that you have to have so many safety aspects of a crossing before a railroad company will consider it uh, a quiet zone meaning that they don't have to blow their horn and so yes these are definitely safety improvements to each of them uh, a lot of them is these raised center medians so that a vehicle cannot go around the crossing arm if it's down um, you'll see that one a lot uh, this one uh, does include uh, extending the sidewalk across the tracks um, right now that doesn't that doesn't exist today um, in a in a good manner people kind of just hop across the tracks at this location um, so there's definitely safety improvements associated with this and is there another concert I'd like to speak uh, to the way to cure a tie or, or uh, decide between a tie is to have you ask permission may I speak or your honor so if anybody would like to uh, any other concert would like to speak let's start that way Anthony? you may what business are we talking about what is the name of the business it's a commercial uh, warehouse owned currently by the Hughes properties it's currently in use they currently have a tenant yes your honor if I may you may um, from your memo they're not using that dock anyway correct uh, currently at this time 
uh, I don't believe that is used on a regular basis. Right. And But they want us to pay them to put another dock on the north side of their building. That is correct. Uh, they've had multiple tenants throughout the years who have use this dock and their concern is that getting rid of it now is kind of their their loss um, if a tenant like that would come back but but understand back in my day when semi trailers were 40 feet long the only thing that sat out in the street was the cab and now a 53 foot trailer sits in the street and the cab so I don't see them using this dock for semis so I have a problem with us proceeding with make negotiating with them and I'll just say this Back in my softball days, as much as I hated the train whistles, um, this whole project for all four of these is just astronomical in cost. And the real safety issue is the next one you're going to get to, it doesn't stop kids from crossing those tracks to go to the aquatic center. The only way to save lives in the future, and heaven forbid we don't have an accident, is that crossing needs to be completely closed. So, but this one, I don't. I just don't see spending the extra money for something that is unnecessary. And that's one of the reasons we're, we're in front of you tonight is we want to make sure that the effort that city staff and our, our consultant Bolton make are uh, putting into this project is, is still the direction that the council has. I assume that Your Honor. Uh, yes, go ahead. For the record, I, I support this. Um, this is a long-term quality of life project and we shouldn't turn back now. Any other counselor wish to speak? Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I know it's specific to just this topic, but uh, Heather, you, you mentioned, is this worth our time and effort? And if we look at the, the memo, it says it's taking longer than anticipated. Looking at Clinton, they just had their first phase of quiet zones go into effect this past spring. That was after four years of work. Uh, Cedar Rapids and Hiawatha, had quiet zones go into effect this fall. That process started in 2018. So I don't discount this is a lot of work and this is a long timeline. But I think if, if we're honest with ourselves, the timeline we're experiencing is the reality of, of this type of project as demonstrated by recent communities that have just done this. So thank you. Yeah, I would echo that um, from Councilor Kell. Um, in our communication with uh, the UP Railroad and their consultant, Benish, um, they have had so much staff turnover um, in the last five, six years that uh, it's hard for a community to gain a lot of traction um, because we're constantly having to bring a new staff member on their end up to speed on the project. Uh, we've had to redo what's called a diagnostic review. Um, which is an on-site um, review with their staff uh, so that they can do a walkthrough. Um, so as Councillor Kell said, uh, it is a long process. It's taking longer than anticipated, um, but that's not unusual in these types of projects. Thank you. I have a question. You, go ahead. I want to look at Diana and say the money is in the bank, correct? I mean, we put, we put bond money in the bank to do this, I don't know, five years ago. Diana Steiner, Finance Director. Yes, we bonded for it in 2020. So that bond is um, already three and a half years old, and that's we're tag teaming on this memo. Um, so the next discussion is that um, whether to um, repurpose the money for this one because we need we need to use the bond money up so we can you know allocate it to streets or something else and then in a future bond we can use this money for the railroad so that's kind of the next topic <laughs> your honor so yeah. while we're on that topic what is the what is the cap and limits that these things have to be uh, allocated or at least encumbered or what what's the restrictions well you need you need to be making progress um, three three years usually you can extend it to five years of progress is being made but we have been stalling out for a while so if it's something that you're interested with I will talk with the bond attorney tomorrow but I wanted to make sure you even were interested in repurposing it to get the money spent I think your honor may I ask a follow-up question go ahead mr. Kell um, how do we define 
that uh, progress is being made. Um, I, I think we can demonstrate clearly that we've been trying to continue what previous councils have decided a couple different times to, to get this over the finish line. So before we arbitrarily say we're not making progress, I think that's a definition that probably needs better clarity. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that we have made progress. Um, you'll notice some of these figures that you're looking at were updated in March of this year. Uh, so every time uh, we have more discussions or we have a, a new individual at Benish, um, I would say that the project is making is making progress. I would not consider this project stalled out at this point. Other council comment? I'm tempted to have you go through the other intersections and then we can um, ask for public comment too. Absolutely. Uh, Second Street Crossing. Uh, this is one that when it was presented to council previously, uh, the option to close this intersection was presented at that time. A uh, council uh, did not want to proceed with closing this crossing. Uh, since that decision was made and since this picture was updated, uh, the UP Railroad has added an additional spur line. Um, so on the screen, you can see uh, a single uh, track and then a double track. They've come in and they've added another track um, and are, are finishing that up. Uh, so there's four tracks as part of the yard right now. Um, that ha will um, result in a train being parked across this area more frequently than it had been in the past. Uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to, again, bring this to council um, because some of the factors have changed since council last made their decision on, on the direction to go with this. Um, at the current time with our quiet zone project, uh, we were only required to add additional signage to this intersect or this at grade crossing um, because of all the other improvements we were doing at the other three. That is still the case. Um, as I was going back and reviewing some of the history before I got involved with this project, uh, the UP Railroad um, several years ago had had made an offer to the to the city of a hundred thousand um, dollars in return for for closing this crossing. Um, they made a comment to me last, I think it was Tuesday, um, that they would offer us much more than that today, and uh, I responded like show me the money, you know, like, can I have a dollar in amount? You know, I don't know what that means. Um, and so I did go out and say, are, are you telling me if we cr uh, close the vehicle uh, crossing here, are you guys going to foot the entire bill for a pedestrian crossing? Um, that's what I threw out there. Obviously, I think that's the extreme and likely a little bit further than, than they're willing to go. Um, but they did say they would take that back and ask the UP. Um, so I'm trying to gauge from the council is, A, if there is any um, desire from council to close the crossing, or if we should just say that's off the table and Heather stop talking to the UP and asking them really how much they're willing to give us. Um, and if there is any interest, you know, give me a starting point um, to continue those negotiations with the UP as far as closing this crossing goes. Your Honor, if I can ask Heather just to clarify a point she just made. You may. Heather, when you said a pedestrian crossing, you meant pedestrian bridge that over is the tracks. That is correct. Okay. Yep. Just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Your Honor. Yes. Another account proposal. I know it's their contractor doing all this work. Maybe if they would just uh, do the work and no charge for the other crossings, that could be um, mutually beneficial deal. You can't see the nodding heads yes by Heather and by our uh, representative from our engineering firm. I think that gives me a little bit uh, of an idea of, of where you may be financially. Um, we're waiting for an updated financial number. Um, one of the reasons the cost of this project is so large is um, within so many feet of the track and certain different scope items, they have to perform them. They will not allow an outside contractor to perform them. So over, I think it's over half of this project is money that the city is paying direct to them to hire a contractor to do the stuff that they would like to do with their signals or with their constant warning. Um, the the pavement and the you know raised medians and stuff like that that we would hire a contractor for um, is probably a smaller piece of the project than some of the stuff that the UP um, would due to their own facilities. Your Honor, one more point of clarification, if I may. You may. 
Um, where are we at with the Manats driveway as far as have you had that recent conversation with the UP about they clearly understand we don't own that land, right? Yeah, I, I have to give a, a credit to Manats on this one. Um, we The city did try to take that stance. Um, the UP came back to us and said, well, you need to require Manats to close this driveway. And we said, well, this is technically not Manats's driveway. This is the UP driveway. It's on UP property. Um, and if you'd like it closed, then you can have that conversation with Manats. Well, that didn't get us very far. Um, and so city staff did go meet with Manats. Uh, Manats was, uh, you know, open to that discussion, and they have since closed off that driveway. Um, so that issue has been resolved. But that is one of them that uh, we worked on this past year and were able to, to work through. Other council comments or questions about this second uh, street? Okay, I'll go ahead and go to our final and fourth at-grade crossing. This is 12th Avenue. Uh, this one has also been a little bit of a back and go, um, start and stop. Uh, the property, again, at the northwest corner is privately owned, and their driveway currently comes in in the area that the railroad would like us to not have a driveway. Uh, so the initial plan, um, I have a, a screenshot of that in my memo, uh, was to close off the driveway here and relocate one uh, up to be directly across from East Madison Street. As we had some discussions with this property owner, um, the UP still wanted their driveway right here. <laughs> um, they just didn't want us to have our driveway here. Um, you can kind of see in the aerial photo, there's two different types of hard surfacing on this lot. One right along the south edge, um, that's a thicker surface that allows for traffic. Everything north of there is a very thin surface that does not hold up to traffic. Uh, so if we relocated the driveway for these gentlemen um, out to be across from Madison Street, uh, they were also going to require us to pave uh, much of the inside of their um, fenced area uh, to be able to maneuver. The additional thing that we looked at is we have a sanitary sewer easement along this area. So if we eliminate our portion of the drive right there, that gets away our access to our sanitary sewer easement. Um, so for that reason, we went back to the UP and said, hey, we, we really need this driveway here. This, this is why. Um, and there is a process that they're willing to uh, work with us on. It's a one-year process. Um, that requires some special notifications. They call it a, an ASI process. Um, and so I'm looking for direction tonight that if we're going to keep moving forward, we're going to go ahead and, and submit that ASA, ASI process and get it going. Um, we actually tried to submit that here probably five or six months ago, and that's when uh, UP's point of contact changed over. Um, and we just got a new one last Tuesday. Um, so... We're ready to go uh, submitting this ASI request uh, if council so chooses us to do that. That'll start a, a one-year clock, um, and then after that one-year clock, I would hope we'd have all the other items in place, but that's probably going to be the longest time frame item that's left out there. Your Honor, that's me again. <laughs> May I? Okay. So is there issue the driveway is within the divider, and they don't want traffic coming, which would be behind the divider, Will they not put a crossing gate at the at the driveway? Is that a, a deal breaker for them? You know, a, a side, cro a small crossing gate over the driveway. I'm going to defer to Greg. I believe the answer is no. On they they won't do a side arm for a driveway, um, but I defer to Greg too. Greg Broussard, Bolton Mink. Uh, so yeah, Gary. The the answer for that is they won't do anything, any side crossing. And if you did, you would have to pay for it. And if you put that in, they're going to want all new signals on the whole intersection and charge the city for it. Quick question again. Then this 12th Avenue is basically done, is it not? It's been there for 20 years. It's got the island. It's got the long gates. It's got uh, uh, you know, sidewalk crossing there. I, I guess I don't. I don't know why this is in the conversation. Yeah. So when when the 
12th Ave intersection was originally done. There are pieces of it when we did our diagnostic review with the UP and all their consultants that we do need to adjust. We need to adjust some of the median ends, but then ultimately when this was a, when that originally was done, the quiet zone and all of the associated paperwork was never filed, so it was never approved. And so now we have to look at the current rules. And the current rules are really looking at that driveway. Um, we cannot have a commercial driveway within 60 foot of the gate arm, or we have to go through uh, that ASM process, which is a year long process because it's a non approved safety measure that we have to show that it meets the requirements for safety improvements there. It's a if, if of all the ones I've done, this is the easiest one to do because it's on the entry side. It's not on an exit side. They can't turn around there. So it, it's an easy it's an easy thing to do, but it is a, a time consuming process because the FRA, like everybody else right now, is, is short staffed. Where these would have taken four to six months, they're now taking a year to go through. So we still have to follow the current requirements because it was never classified as a quiet zone when it was originally built. No, it was. It, it's one of those things that hindsight is twenty twenty. When it was originally installed, it was very close to meeting all the quiet zone requirements. I'm not sure a hundred percent of the background on the thought process on why all of it got installed and the quiet zone wasn't looked at for this intersection. So that's that's one of those things that we've just kind of got to figure out how to move forward based on what we have today. I'm assuming to have the safety zones or quiet zones for all four. It's going to take all four intersections to have it for the railroad will deaden the noise, right? Yeah. That's correct. When they looked through the scoring criteria, uh, doing as little as we are to the second street crossing right now, um, that, was, that was kind of the tipping point. If we do any less than that, we are no longer qualifying for a, a quiet zone. Other council comments or questions? You want to thank me? You may. The uh, UP also uses their whistles to communicate uh, when they couple and uncouple uh, trains, correct? That's correct. So we'll still have noise? That's correct. Thank you. Your, Your Honor, if there's no one else, I have a question. Um, well, I was going to go with public comment, but um, any other kind of solicitor sort of speak first because that's what the rule is, and if nobody else does, then you're up. So, um, Greg or Heather, do we have data? You know, this is more than quiet zone. This is safety, okay? And I understand the original data showed that it's only going to quiet 47 minutes a day was the original study because, you know, we listened to the, the switching yard all day long. But the other issue is, have we had pedestrian train accidents? Have we had vehicle train accidents on these four intersections? I mean, the, the one of my concern is the second street one. It, you know, like I've said before, it needs to be closed, just closed. But the other three, do we have data that shows, do we have a safety issue? I am not aware of the accident tally saying that there's a safety concern, um, but as you go through general engineering practices, we have a safety concern. Um, and that 47 minutes um, is 41 minutes as of the last uh, update um, that I had had Greg pull for us. And, and this is still, when we first decided on this, it was a million and a half dollar project, and now going forward, we're probably looking at a $2.2 .2 million project? I'm still waiting for final updates um, from the UP, but right now I have a budgeted total project cost of $1.4 million. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure. Public comment? Questions? <coughs> uh, Mark Eaton, 1007 South 10th Avenue. I've been attending council meetings for a long time. And I was there when this whole project started. And one of the things I remember, um, maybe my brain is fried by now, but um, Second Avenue is a utility corridor underneath the tracks. Mr. Lamer said, hey, I don't think you can close that because it's got all these utilities under it. And you then... You corrected me, you mean Second Street? Second, second Street. Avenue. Thank you. Second Street. And then um, Ms. Kinzer submitted a grant at one point. We didn't get it, but it seems that there's an intent to put a bike trail 
from the new trailhead by the softball diamonds up 6th Street to the Iowa River Trail to connect it with the uh, Lane Creek Trail. And we're talking just a sidewalk right now. And so is it a trail or is it a sidewalk? Have we made up our mind? Can we have it be a trail? And why don't we just wait and figure this all out and use the money right now for roads? I'll do my best to answer part of that um, and then invite Greg up here as well. Uh, my understanding is currently with the layout that we have at 6th Street, uh, a 10-foot trail would not fit through there uh, with where some of the UP has some of their um, signals and, and those kind of things, uh, which is why it's shown as a 5-foot sidewalk. Yeah, exactly what Heather was saying there. So if we look to go to a 10-foot trail, the issue starts to get to be our clearances on specifically that northwest corner there. Um, we could look at taking it to a trail, but the cost would be uh, much more expensive to do that. And then the question is, as we take it to a trail, does the UP then classify it as a new crossing that we have to try to get a new crossing across that, which um, is not a an easy process for them at all? Going back to the, the question about 2nd Street, um, yep, we know that there's sanitary and water under that, but closing the street does not mean that those utilities can't stay. We'd still keep easements to be able to maintain those, but we could close the street, and then that would still allow for future maintenance. You'd still have to bore under, uh, under the track just like you would today for any future improvements. Other public comment? Neil DeLaw, 1504 Brentwood Terrace. Uh, I fully agree closing 2nd Street. Um, there's usually a train parked there most of the day anyway. I mean, it'd be a great study if somebody had time to, to track and monitor how much time that train sits, right? Uh, it'd be all great for a pedestrian to connect uh, that sidewalk where they put the, the, the Wilson Circle Trail to connect um, the y YMC piece of it that goes in the back. But... I lived here for 10 years. I could do without the train whistles. You know, they say you, you get used to it. I don't. Still wakes me up at night. I play softball, kickball. Um, we go to Megaton Park. was just there yesterday. It's loud, right? 110 decibels. This is also a quality of life issue, right? If those whistles went away when there's a fast-moving train or just a slow-moving train, that would be a great progress, not only for folks like me, the kids in the area, but also downtown, right? When you're shopping downtown, when visitors come, that's one less little pet peeve that could annoy somebody, right? It'd be good for businesses, good for the hotel rooms, the historic buildings. And what, what Heather said, right? If somebody's in the intersection, they should be looking both ways, right? Making sure there's nothing coming, but the, the engineers that are running that train have the ability to blow their horn, right? So please support this. Uh, as a resident, um, we have new engineers always coming to Emerson. They, they live in the new Cading development. They hear it all the time. If, how long do you get used to it, right? 20, 30, 40 years? I'm still not used to it. So I'm supportive of this project. Uh, I hope you guys do. Thanks. Jolene Ballard, 610 North 2nd Avenue. I'm glad this picture is up there. I have big questions about that dock supposedly on the south side. I delivered mail for nine and a half years, went right by that. Never saw anybody using that dock. My guess is the owners want the city to close the dock. Thank you. Kelly Thurston, 102 West South Street. I am personally very much in support of the quiet zones. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Marshalltown. Um, it's not something that you really get used to. Um, my personal home is about six, seven blocks away from this location. We have two small kids. We hear the trains all the time. And we also enjoy the Mega Ten Park, and we hear them all the time there. And also with my profession as a real estate professional, you would 
maybe be surprised how frequently this question comes up when I am showing homes to homeowners. And there is nothing that dampens the experience when we are either entering or exiting the home like a loud train whistle. Particularly if it is someone that is moving here not from our community. They come from larger communities that already have quiet zones and it is very much a quality of life issue. So if we are talking about attracting and retaining talent bridge the gap of the $1.4 million to new people living here, people working here, raising families here, owning homes here, and paying taxes here. This is a quality of life issue. Thank you. Linda Clark, 306 South 2nd Avenue. And I am a lifetime resident here. I support the Union Pacific, the historic train yard that we have, and there's nothing wrong with the persons that are living along the trains that are objecting to the horns blowing. And I plan to stay here living here, and I appreciate all of the freight that goes through Marshalltown and all of the employees that do work for the Union Pacific that work really hard. And yes, those, if they don't like the trains, you must not like the freight going through either. The freight that's going through on those trains are the businesses here in Marshalltown. I've lived long enough to know which boxcars and what goes through and what doesn't go through. And thank you, Mr. Hoop, for voting as I had asked you to do, because we've lived here a long time. And I think we don't need the quiet zone. We have ample bridges for people to get across and take other routes. Second Street is the only one that I was actually concerned about, having a walk path. That would be good because that goes over to the Y. But the Union Pacific does us a very good service, and I very much appreciate them. Kelly Thurston, 102 West South Street again. Um, I also live very close to the police and fire station, and I have noticed after their uh, implementation of living there, after a certain point, uh, they do the courtesy of late night not using their sirens, and they go with just lights. We've seen that quality of life change in my personal household, uh, where my youngest daughter's bedroom is. We've had, we put blackout curtains, but otherwise they used to do those loud, sound, those loud sirens two, three, four in the morning whenever they're going out on a call. Now that they don't do that right in that neighborhood, that does not make me feel any less about the quality of service that those people provide to our community. So if I don't hear a train horn, that does not mean that the freight that they're carrying and the work that they're providing is any less valuable. Thank you. Anyone else? Ron, if I may. You may. I'm, I'm in support of this project. Um, the only question that I have really is the second street crossing. I know we've talked quite a bit about whether to close it or not. Um, and I think in the end we probably ought to. But I think we shouldn't close it until we get Center Street Bridge done. That's uh, because. When we close Center Street Bridge, boy, I'd, it's going to be used. Um, but looking at the traffic, I know that it will affect the Y somewhat. But um, I, I think just closing the intersection makes the most sense in the long run. Thank you. It's been a long time since we had this discussion. But back when we did the last, I timed it. Uh, to see how long it takes to, instead of using 2nd Street to go on the 6 Street Viaduct, I think it was 90 seconds, give or take 10, depending on traffic at the four-way stop. Um, but I'll have to time it again. Anyway, if, if you're driving, it doesn't take very long to get from one place to the other. Heather? Yep, I did pull up the map uh, showing you know, the relationship of the 2nd Street crossing to the Center Street Viaduct and both the 3rd 6th Street Viaduct. Um, as, as you said, there's an opportunity to go both directions. We understand when Center Street Viaduct is closed, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, um, but there is going to be an avenue to, to go out the 3rd and 6th Street crossing. Uh, absolutely from a timing perspective, I don't know how these two projects would potentially, um, but that may be a, a negotiation point that we use um, if Council so chooses us to do so. 
Do you mm -hmm. need any uh, more response from the council about whether to go forward or not? Yeah, I, I would because I if if the council is open to closing Second Street, that changes our scoring criteria and the interaction that we have uh, with the plan that we're presenting to the UP Railroad. So that was one of the reasons we wanted to come tonight to make sure that this current council, I hope this current council is the same council that's sitting here when we are bringing you plans to go out and bid. Um, so we want to make sure we're good now so we can keep on this path um, and, and we have what, what you guys want in front of, front of you. Your Honor, yes. I'll start it off. I'm in favor of closing Second Street Crossing. So we consider that to be a motion. Ask for a second. Uh, I'd make a second on that. Okay. Let's call the roll on that one. Anybody need it repeated? Okay. Roll call. Schneider. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Hoop. Uh, yes. Hell. Ladihoff? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Thank you for that direction. Uh, just so you're aware, in my next communication with Benish, I'm still going to play hardball. Um, I want that number that they offer us financially for closing Second Street to be as high as it can be. Um, do you guys want me to push for a pedestrian bridge or yes. push financially? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I, I think that gives me direction. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll work on on that aspect um, while we're doing this. Uh, I think the other motion maybe that I would like is confirmation to go ahead and proceed with the one year ASM process on the 12th Ave um, crossing. Is there a motion for that one, Your Honor? I just have a comment first, if that's okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, be careful out there. Go ahead. Um, if we make a motion to proceed with this, are we locking in a dollar figure, or are we going to wait and have it come back as a resolution? Are you going to have set numbers? Because I have a feeling this is going to skyrocket on us. Uh, you're talking right. a whole year out just for that one study. Mm -hmm. So you're talking a year and a half before we vote on a dollar figure. Right. This motion that you're making tonight is is not an end-all motion. I just want to make sure that what we're doing now is going to get us in that running. Um, also, in my communication with them on the 12th Ave uh, intersection, I'm fighting, you know, if, if you guys don't have to go through a 12-month process to keep your drive, why are you making us go through a 12-month process to keep our other half of the drive? So I'm hoping maybe I can somehow get that down um, less than a year as well. Um, but that gives me the direction that I need to keep pushing forward on that aspect. Um, so if we're good with that, I think the only other item uh, would be Diana's item as far as how to handle the finances and the bond funds associated with this project. Uh, I believe her recommendation is going to go ahead and uh, bring forward a resolution at the next council meeting uh, utilizing the bond funds that we have on hand associated with this project, switch them from general corporate purpose, which allows us to use them on this project, to essential corporate purpose um, to go into the Pot of Funds Street Improvement Program. Um, this would allow you in the future when we get numbers uh, to take a look at the bonds that we have on hand or a f potential future bond and utilize uh, bond funding in the future for funding this project. That will allow us to get through the bond funds a little bit sooner. Let me propose this. I'll consider it's uh, uh, probably by consensus that you should continue the discussions with the railroad about 12th Avenue unless somebody objects right now to doing that. And then I assume that Diana needs to be checking with the bond council and coming back to us later. So I don't think you need to vote on that one either for council direction, right? Well, if if the if bond council um, says yes, we need to we need to repurpose the money because it's just going to take too long to spend. Um, then you know <clears throat> we would need an option of what we're going to use it for. So if you just want to us. If you want to direct me to go ahead and use it as street improvements, and that's the way we'll draft the resolution for next time. Anybody object to that up here? I think we all know yeah, that streets are a major problem or a major thing we need to fix here. Well, one of you on the phone was going to speak, though. Yes, thank you. This is Barry.
Barry. Uh, I guess I'm, I just go back. I, I don't discount or disagree anything we're, we're talking about specific to the need for road improvements, but I, I don't understand why we need to change the designation tonight. Um, I think Diana has some homework to do. I think Heather has some homework to do. Why don't we make the decision when we can evaluate everything fully? Um, so that would be my recommendation. Not, not to say we can't change down the road, but I don't, I don't see why on March 11th we need to make this decision less all the information. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, I was trying to head that direction too, uh, figuring staff will be coming back to us after getting more uh, uh, details from the people they need to get the details from, including bond council. Yeah. Okay, I think that is the consensus on, on that one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. On to Riverview Park Project Update. Jeff Hubbard, Park and Rec Director. Um, some of you were on the council back in 2021 when we um, did a review of, of Riverview Park Master Plan. Um, and the reason why we kind of did that master plan was we were going to need to expand the lagoon. The, the water, the, the pond that was built on the south side of the park was not going to meet the demand of the 100-year flood. And so we needed to expand the lagoon. And we're like, well, if we're going to expand the lagoon, it's going to affect things like the disc golf course, other possible buildings, parking lot roads, things like that. So we came up with um, this master plan. So for some of the new counselors, I'll just be real quick. It looked at uh, renovating the campground. Um, reducing the number of spots, but making them all full hookups. That was going to be about a $4.6 million cost. The lagoon itself was going to be $2.5 million. Um, we were going to add an amphitheater there where the number one is located um, that would be able to have uh, a, a concert venue, a, a festival-type atmosphere there, um, some improvements to the dog park, and then an addition of uh, four pickleball courts. Uh, so that was what we came up with in uh, 2022. Um, since then, in 2023, we have found out that we do not need to expand the lagoon, um, that the pond that is on the south side of the park will handle the, that 100-year flood. So <clears throat> that got me, I guess, thinking and talking to other people on staff. Should we spend $2.2 million to build a lagoon if we don't need to? Um, other conversations have been, do we, should we spend $4.6 million on a campground um, that you know, has 40-some spots in it? If we charge 50 bucks a spot a night, will we recoup that money? Um, also, the campground, uh, the county has just per, uh, started now doing uh, campground improvements out at Greencastle. They also have Timmins Grove. You know, so do we really need to be in the campground business to the tune of uh, $4.6 million? Uh, other discussions have have talked about was, you know, are we ever going to have a 10,000 person event in Marshalltown that we need to have this big amphitheater? Uh, if you've been to the Harvest Market the last couple of years, uh, one of the great cover bands in Iowa, the Pork Tornadoes, have played, and have had about 3,000 people there, and I think there's room for a few more thousand uh, out in the ball field and other areas. Um, so I think we have ample space there. We uh, also, during this plan, we didn't have the water plaza con uh, project being done. That has a great place to be. It's, it's a water plaza, a gathering space. That could be a place where I could see you could have a few thousand people with actually access to better parking uh, for some type of larger festival. We'd, we'd work, work with the Y, obviously, to make that happen. Um, so what our plan is now I think has changed and um, we had budgeted 12 million dollars roughly over the next uh, fiscal years right now we have currently 2.5 million dollars in, in an FY24 and a 22 geo bond um, that I would like to scale back the Riverview Park project to uh, do some work to the lagoon there still needs to be, be some stuff down on the, the south end um, create some weirs so the water can't flow back into the south pond um, some other improvements, including the bridge that's there that goes from a union hall to community building. It's a very old, outdated, and not very attractive and safe bridge. Um, replace the playground equipment that is a reunion hall. Um, put in some pickleball courts, because I think having some on the north side of town would give us a nice range of pickleball from Kiwanis Park to right outside here at, at the Coliseum and also the high school and then on the north side of town. And then maybe we can be done building pickleball courts in town. 
we will see. And then that allows us to then have some extra money for the Bolton and Mink contract and some contingency money. Um, and then maybe in the, in the future years, um, we could come back and ask for some, some road repair improvement monies and things like that, which I think are a need, but not an immediate need right now and doesn't really fit into the 2.5 million budget that we kind of have. So I think this gives us some bang for a buck in the park with some great amenities that people have been wanting to see. Um, and we can then uh, maybe come back to council a, at a future bond uh, thing to, to do some other improvements there in the future. Thanks, um, Sue. Question, questions about the council or comments? So we're still proposing to have the loop? Uh, I would not do the loop. So I'm showing you the next picture here right now. The loop would be adding the roadways, which uh, the roadways and the sidewalks was a $2, $2 million um, plan. So that was probably that would be something I would probably come back with in the future would be the loop. The, the, loop, the loop was kind of intended to be there if we did have a huge event to, to direct traffic in and out of there in a safe uh, fashion. If we're not doing those bigger events there and you're just going there for the dog park, disc golf, the, the shelter buildings, things like that, I don't know that the loop is necessary um, at this point. So, so that would be number four on your, on your map. So you're not proposing that? Your Honor? Right not at this time, no. Yes, go ahead. Is there any way that for the remote participants here we could see what you're sharing, Jeff? I feel like I'm at a disadvantage. Or is this just the the Bolton and Mink overview that we've seen before? It's the Bolton and Mink you've seen before. The only uh, change to it is kind of a newer drawing that shows it scaled back with, without touching the campground um, and the lagoon. Okay. Uh, just a comment. I still yeah. think we need to invest in uh, Riverview Park, the north side of town. Uh, we're trying to encourage people to develop that way. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, Riverview Park was pretty awesome. It, it's definitely lost its shine. I know a lot of that's due to the derecho, so we definitely do need some investment. I think I'd want to see some preliminary drawings of what this new proposal would look like. And I can email this out to everybody tomorrow. Okay. So so the road improvements were, were going to be about $2 million. So we can either do the, the fun, cool things like pickleball, or we can do the roads. I guess was was my uh, two options. I'm not a real fan of pickleball. <laughs> I don't I don't know how much pickleball is done in town. I really don't. Uh, are we to, today oh, today I, just today I just heard pickleball play outside my office for about three hours. So when you're talking about replacement, though, you're also adding your playground uh, sw switch, your new bridge, your other facilities in there as well, not just the road, right? Correct. I see a lot of shine in the new options put in or the upgraded options being put in more so than I see the shine in a, in a road. Yeah, so if you see in the funding allocations, I mean, we have in FY27, we had $3 million to be potentially used, $2 million in FY28. Um, so maybe we could wait till 27, FY27 and ask for the, the $3 million and then do all the road and sidewalk improvements. The new playground equipment goes in, right? Yeah. Correct. So for the 2.5, I, I would be proposing the, 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 the bridge and lagoon work, uh, the reunion hall playground, pickleball courts. You're on with me? <clears throat> you may. Jeff, you said the bridge. Now, is that just going to be a new bridge, or is that something that we can sandblast and, and paint and make it look good again? No. It, it's really it, bad. It's structurally bad. It's got chain link fence on the sides of it because it, when it originally was built, I don't think it was really designed up to the standards. Uh, we have replaced the wood planks on them, but they're just normal uh, wood planks. We got at Menards and that fit in there, and they're already kind of starting to bend and warp. Um, so I think a new bridge like we have out at Timber Creek or other parks that we would be doing would be more beneficial. And I think that was, was like a $250,000 budgeted item. Thank you. Oh, that bridge is junk. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Kell. That was your words, not Thank mine. Thank you. Um, I guess my, my thoughts on this is I, I don't disagree we need to be realistic with our budget, but basically in, in two short years, I don't think our, our future budget uh, outlook has changed dramatically, and we, we've gone from this aspirational project that I don't discount to now basically 20% of it. 
So I guess I, I would just challenge challenge ourselves into the future um, when we do these type of activities. The amount of, of resources and time spent, spent by city staff, by our consultant, by public outreach to to basically take this away when, when we knew it was going to be a heavy lift all along. Um, I think we can be, we should hold ourselves more accountable and, and be better throughout this process. Uh, like Councillor Schneider said, this is a legacy location for Marshalltown. A uh, huge amount of investment being done uh, on that northern portion of town. So this is a great opportunity for, um, for a, a significant improvement to our community, reasons for people to come, reasons for people to stay, uh, amenities to go visit. So I, I'm all for making Riverview uh, as best as it can be. I'm just, I'm a little disappointed that we're, we're descaling this so quickly, so so abruptly after this being first brought up. Thank you. Other council comment? Your Honor, if I may. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a, a real good idea, but if we do this, we're going to have to really step up and make sure we uh, clean up the northeast side and, and make it more presentable so that people can come. Thank you. And any other council comment? Otherwise, public comment. Lee Botter, 401 Orchard Drive. Um, I want to just say thank you to Jeff. Um, sometimes he and I don't agree on things. And um, we've been a big proponent for the past decade, even with prior uh, staff before him, on looking at the parks and what do we do with the parks and how do we get art there and how do we make sure that we're doing uh, this from an economical standpoint. Uh, to drive business to town, that kind of thing. So, Jeff, I think you need a round of applause, actually, for doing what you've done. So, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Linda Clark, 306 South 2nd Avenue. And I enjoyed Riverview Park, and I still do. And we need to have amenities that benefit all persons. We talk about new playground equipment. We have disabled people that need to have special things like that. And yes, the bridges, they do kind of fall apart down there. But I remember when we had a swimming pool and everything there. We had two swimming pools in this town, as a matter of fact. And so I haven't been down there much. But I do remember people used to tent camp. They like to do that. And people are coming in, you know, to see the renovation, you know, of the big vehicles on the rock. And I would like to have some more campgrounds down there, the old-fashioned kind, like what they used to have. Motorcycle riders come in with their trailers and do that. And I would like to see that again, because that happened in this town. And, and I'm not planning on leaving. But, you know, we'll go back to the train whistle since she got to speak twice. There wasn't any people that lived along the tracks that asked to have the quiet zone. And the trains were here before that. And I know the engineers are considerate on what they do. Two longs and a short, I have lived that. And I don't have a problem with that. We have ambulances, we have fire trucks, we have all kinds of things that are noisy. We have motorcycles that are noisy. You're not germane to the topic, ma'am. Oh, I'm not germane. Nope. Okay. We well, already the... covered that one. We're on a different topic now. Okay. We're on Riverside Park, not about trains. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you let her talk twice. All right. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Let's go on to the next topic. <coughs> Uh, well, unless staff felt you needed any further direction, I don't think so. Uh, disposal of city lots by sealed bid. Yes, Your Honor. Um, back in December of 2022, the council passed a resolution of support for a community block grant disaster recovery funding for infill housing. The city owned seven lots that were designated to that project. And um, once that application was sub submitted to the state, um, it was determined that the city could not 
act as the developer of their own project. Uh, so the city had multiple meetings with different developers trying to get them on board with the project criteria, um, but we were unable to find one that could do the project within the parameters. So we discontinued our application for that funding and we now have these seven lots that are vacant that we need to dispose of. Um, we also acquired 819 North 5th Avenue during the Edgewood Extension Project. That lot was going to be used for the NFL Housing Project also. Um, staff would like to combine that with 817 North 5th Avenue um, to sell that as a, a larger lot. Uh, we also own 406 Lee Street and 708 Lee Street from tax certificates. So those lots are also empty. Um, staff's looking for a direction to proceed with sealed bids to dispose of these lots, and we would do that in three different rounds. Any council comment? Your Honor, if I may. You may. Um, this, I hate to see this go. Um, it's a really good idea, um, but I've talked with staff quite a bit about it. Um, we can't get contractors to build the houses, um, so uh, I'm in favor of uh, just turning around and just putting them up for sealed bids like we do the other ones. Um, I wish it would have worked out differently, but at some point you got to move on. Thank you. Your Honor. You bet. Other counsel? Public comment? Your Honor. Yes, sir. Mr. Kell. <clears throat> yeah, I, I understand the realities of the community block development grant and, and the hope what that would do. I guess I would um, maybe throw out an audible and, and ask for maybe a, a change in direction here because the best of my knowledge, all the lots we sold previously, I'm not aware of any building actually occurring on these lots. The, the handful that were selected for the community block development grant are the lots that are in fact big enough to be built upon. Um, so I, I don't know if, if that's an RFP process or what, but I, I think we need to think a little bit more holistically on what the future of some of these larger lots look like versus the sealed bed proposal. Thank you. Other council comments? Your Honor, if I may? Sure. Just want to clarify uh, that I know for a fact that some of the lots we've sold will be built on in the near future, and I know for a fact that there are bidders out there that will be building on a couple of these lots for sure already so there is some movement to build on these lots and I do I do agree that we need to let these go anybody else up here any member of the public wish to address this one do we need um, a motion to direct staff on this one to make a motion that uh, we dispose of these lots by uh, sealed beds. Second. Roll call. Schneider? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Hoop? Yes. Kell? No. Ladihoff? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Staff has direction on to disposal of dangerous and dilapidated buildings. I was waiting until she got up there to tell her to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Heather Thomas filling in for community development uh, this evening on this item. Um, so this is going to talk about uh, residential houses that we have currently that we've acquired through the 657A process. Um, potentially some of these, I think maybe one of them actually came through a nuisance tax sale. Um, so we have these four lots that I have up on the screen, 501 North First Ave, 704 Lee Street, 915 South Center, and 919 South Center. In the past, we've obtained these. We've hired a consultant to put together a demolition contract. We hire a contractor to come demolish the building, and then we proceed with a sealed bid process to dispose of the lot. Um, on, on this particular list, uh, both uh, Alicia and I have received some inquiry 
from adjacent property owners or people who maybe aren't adjacent to the building um, where they may have some interest to purchase the building as is. There's some pros and cons there. These are, are properties that have, have been an eyesore, a nuisance, a safety concern in some cases, um, and, and that our code enforcement has got to a point where they weren't able to enforce the code, and that's why it went the 657A route. Uh, so in some discussion with the city attorney, I asked what options we might have. Um, as a public works director, if I have a, a block that has 10 houses, or I have a block that has six houses, my cost to maintain that infrastructure, the road, the sanitary sewer, storm sewer, uh, Marshtown Waterworks water main is the same. So it's advantageous for the city to have homes on these lots. And so we were trying to decide if we had a way to make that happen in these. Um, and there is, I've included a, a example purchase agreement uh, where there's an option that we can sell these lots yet require them to do something with them. They have to get to back to a, an occupancy level in a certain time frame, or there would be, uh, it would revert back to the city, essentially. Do they have the option of demolishing it as well? Uh, in the purchase agreement, that's uh, an example, that was one of the options as well, yes. So somebody could purchase the house, demolish it themselves, um, and, and proceed with, with what they want to do with the lot. Um, so I guess we're bringing these forward to you to get some council direction. If this is something that you'd like city staff to pursue further with the city attorney at some type of a process like this, it would still be a sealed bid process, um, but it would have some stipulations associated with, meaning you know, the bidder, we can put in some eligibility requirements. The eligible bidder cannot have you know, more than two code enforcement cases in the last 12 months something like that to try to prevent these homes from falling into hands that maybe aren't going to, to take care of them the way that we would like them to be taken care of. Um, so in your packet, I've included pictures of all four properties. I think some of the properties have more potential than other properties. Some of them maybe do, just need to be demolished, but um, I wanted to bring that to council for your guys' direction on, on to city staff. Well, if there, Greg Nichols, if there, there's interest in buying them as is, now I, I, I looked at those houses and, and most of those just look like demolish is the only option. But there's, a, there's at least one that could maybe be saved. But if somebody's interested in buying them as is, that would save us the whole demolition cost, it would save us a lot of time, and it would save our staff time as well. I tried to estimate what it costs the city for, for one of these types of properties. Um, there's also, there's costs, you know, with the city attorney as far as the 657A process. Uh, once we get one of these properties in our hands, we usually send a nuisance abatement contractor to take care of some of the out exterior um, issues right off the bat. Usually there's a, a fair amount of junk on the property or trees that need to be removed. Um, we usually board up the building, so there's some costs there that the city has sunk into it. Uh, if we were to demolish it, we then hire a contractor to, to disconnect the sanitary sewer and the water main, and then we would go out, hire a contractor uh, to demolish the house, and best guess, we're probably 40 grand into one of these houses to do that typical process we've done in the past. Heather, do we have a hard and fast uh, minimum housing standards rule? We have a property maintenance code that has some set, uh, you know, requirements. You, know, you, you got to have windows. Mm -hmm. You have to have steps to the door. Yeah, I mean, just the very basic uh, siding in that. Right. Um, can we hold them to that? And that's exactly why we wanted to bring um, this forward. We want to list those out. If somebody wants to purchase it and wants to rebuild it, that's fine. But I think they're going to have to follow that minimum housing standard. Mm -hmm. And that is just doors, windows, siding, a roof. Um, Connection to utilities. Style. Yeah. Yeah. And with a reasonable time frame. Right. Yeah. Your Honor? Yes. What would be a reasonable time frame to uh, rehab this uh, house here? We see in this picture. Less time than it takes to get the railroad to cooperate on things. Right? 
Your Honor, if I may. Go ahead. I'm, I'm the big advocate for infill development, saving historic houses. The only house I haven't seen is the one on Lee Street. So I'd be my first question would be, which of the properties have people, all four of them or just a couple of them, that they want, they want the house? I believe I've heard of two of the properties that we've, I've received inquiry in. I don't know if Felicia, I believe uh, 501 North First Ave, I believe somebody inquired about that. And then I believe um, 915 South Center Street was the other one. As much as I want to see these houses saved, I just can't believe that this isn't a landlord buying it to rent it out because you're talking about foundation problems, everything else. 501 North First, First Avenue is the closest one to me. There is no yard. It's, it's the house next to it is a nuisance. I mean, you think, you think these guys have a problem out here in the audience. The house next to it is the definition of a nuisance ordinance violation. Yep. As much as I want to save these, as much as I want to save the taxpayers' money, I just, I think we're just, if we sell these, I think then we're going to go, we're, they're going to get a lawyer because it's going to be a landlord, and we're going to be fighting the process no matter what we lay out and what they sign. I think we're going to be fighting a pro legal process later to get them back off, you know. It, I just, I just, I think we're just prolonging an issue. I think these four houses need to be torn down. That, that's where I stand. Even more dangerous to us than landlords is the people are the people that have figured out they can buy it and sell it on contract and have it boomerang back to them every year or two or three. Yep, and, and that is that is in our purchase agreement that that would not be allowed. Got it. Okay, yeah. because that that's where we don't even get the safety inspections or other inspections to make sure they're habitable. Yeah. Um, Your Honor. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it, we'd be penny wise and pound foolish to go this way. I hate to see things be wasted, but uh, I agree with Gary. I think we should just tear them down, sell the empty lots. Those pictures are pretty bad. Inside well, and out. I was going to say the 915, just by exterior looks and kind of walking around, it looked like it was maybe salvageable. I'd say the other houses that I looked at them, you'd have to start at the very foundation and go up. That's why we brought the decision to you guys. <laughs> I was going to joke that that's because we make all the big bucks up here, but what yeah. I know is we get uh, these counselors up here get about half the pay of any city our size. Uh, so it's not big bucks up here. Um, anybody either want to make a motion or should we just have consensus take them down? I suppose in the meantime, if you get a really bona fide offer and somebody looks like they've got the wherewithal to do something, we could have you explore the. Uh, um, contract option. I say, if you guys give me consensus tonight to tear them down, I'll be making a call tomorrow to uh, have our WHKS continue with the demolition contracts. I just wanted to at least bring it forward as an option before I put those wheels in motion. Would you sleep Your Honor? if we made a motion? <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to just say, let's consider that as a consensus, tear them down, unless somebody objects to that right now up here. I'll make a motion. Just go ahead and tear them down. I'll Get second that. Here. I mean, we'll otherwise we're just going to be chasing it, chasing these guys around. Right. Roll call. Kel. Yes. Lottiehoff. Yes. Mitchell. Yes. Nichols. Yes. Schneider. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Hoop. Yes. Uh, Carrie, the sheer amount of work that you have to do on this stuff, Heather, is why um, I've directed that we need to increase the pay for hiring the next engineer that we need to have come to town to help you on this stuff. It's incredible how much stuff you handle here. We need a community development director on that item. Yeah. Not an engineer. <laughs> okay. All right. Next. Next item. All right. This next item is discussing parking rules. Um, our chapter is Chapter 72. Primarily, it relates to residential parking rules. So I know there's some issues on the northeast side of town. Um, of the parcels that have been brought to our attention over the last month and a half, only one of those parcels is zoned residential. Um, so it is not that we are ignoring that issue. It's that we have an issue here that we've been working on actually for um, probably about 
nine months at this point uh, to try to get some clarity to um, that we'd like to proceed with. So with this, um, in 2023, uh, Public Works staff noticed some discrepancies in the brand new zoning code, uh, Chapter 156, that was passed by Council in 2022. Um, there's also some discrepancies a little bit in some of the terminology that's used in fire code related to the, the terminology all weather. All weather and fire code refers to a hard surface and gravel is not all weather. Uh, the zoning code um, that was recently passed in, in 2022 adds gravel as an all weather. Um, so that was the first item that came to our attention that we wanted to, to look into this further. Um, as far as complaints that we receive, we commonly receive complaints about yard parking or parking on grass. Um, and sometimes it's parking on gravel as well. Uh, back in 2010, the city council uh, did an ordinance amendment that restricted gravel, new gravel, going in in front yards of residential properties. So all driveways needed to be hard surface. So that would be concrete, asphalt, and brick. Um, and so that was effective January 1 of 2010. Uh, in 2023, in November and December, uh, some of the engineering staff technicians went around uh, to take a look and understand how much of a problem we did have with yard parking. And we had 364 properties that we noticed in residential areas where people were parking what I would consider on the yard, um, either grass or potentially in some cases, I'm going to say gravel-ish. Like it might have been gravel at one point, but there's probably more grass and weeds there today than, than what there was in the past. And so this is what prompted us to kind of take a look at Chapter 72. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about what council wants for a driveway material, kind of the discrepancies that I've brought up. Uh, we have a zoning code that allows gravel. We have a fire code that does not allow gravel. Uh, chapter 72 didn't allow gravel after January 1 of 2010, and then our driveway permitting process doesn't allow gravel front side or rear yards. Um, so we want to get some clarity on that. Uh, we also went through here and there was some conflicting information on whether people were allowed to park in the terrace or the street right-of-way area. Um, and so we're clarifying that to where it is allowed if it does not create a visual hazard. It is a designated parking area. So we have some businesses that have a paved terrace where it is intended for people to park, um, but we don't want those vehicles there for more than 24 hours. So we've clarified different sections of this code so it all says the same. Um, we're also recommending uh, a change in the allowable width of a driveway extension. Uh, right now our code has a 10 foot width. Um, one of the challenges is that that 10 foot width works in some cases, but every once in a while there may be an overhang on a garage that doesn't count for that 10 foot. So if they were going to put like an RV or motorhome back behind their building, they don't have the width anymore. Um, so we constantly get requests for a wider driveway extension than what the 10 foot allows. Um, as long as they're following the other requirements that zoning has for where you can put a driveway extension, um, we're comfortable with, with changing that to 16 feet. And I think that's gonna help some of the, the properties in town that would like to do some more improvements to theirs. And then we're also recommending in some of the violation sections of this uh, to refer to our fee schedule um, for where those fees are set and not specifically in this language. Um, so there's going to be several sections that I've kind of outlined in my discussion here that I'm going to pull up to talk specifics with you guys as far as what you guys would like. So first one is going to be on page 12. So those following at home, we have 48 viewers at home right now, by the way, um, watching. How do you know that? Uh, I was back there running the the system before I walked up, so I apologize that they can't see my screen right now. They're probably looking at you guys. Um, but uh, we would like staff uh, direction of what you guys would like allowable for driveway material. Um, as I mentioned, depending on what section you look at now, uh, let's just talk front yard first of all. Is everybody in agreement that we should maintain what our current code says as far as gravel is not allowed in the front yard for driveways. Your Honor? Yes. Heather, I'm okay with that, except in, in First Ward where I live, where Mike and I live, um, there's a ton of gravel driveways. 
So how do you? How are you guys going to distinguish that they? Are we going to allow them to re-gravel an existing gravel driveway? Yes. We sh okay. So how do you guys know which ones are new and which ones are? We better? have a catalog of historical photos uh, that engineering used to be able to go back and, and look through time on. Okay. That. So front front driveways that are already gravel. The owners are allowed to not expand it, but re-gravel it as time needs, right? Yes, they're allowed to maintain it. In here, we also talk about must be free from, free from grass and weeds. And so if the grass and weeds keep, you know, growing up, that is a yard parking violation until they maintain that. So we're changing the width of a concrete driveway to go to 16 feet, but we're not going to allow those people that have a gravel driveway to widen it if they need to. Correct. So sounds like we maybe are all in consensus on that item. Uh, next one, a little less consistency between the different zoning, engineering permits, and stuff are side and rear yards. What is council's thoughts as far as allowing gravel on rear and side yards? I think I'm OK. Yeah, I'm um, let's go with you, Mr. Kell. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't think anyone was speaking up. Um, I apologize. I, I tried to do some research on this. I, I guess this is probably a great opportunity for us to to benchmark and, and use best standards uh, from what other communities have, like our size or larger. Um, absent that, we're just kind of giving our, our gut feel. Uh, I think. I think there's a, a real opportunity here to to make sure we're following best practices here. That would be that would be my input. Thank you. Sure, Mr. Lotha. Yes, I I'm okay with gravel in the rear uh, in the back backyard. Um, I don't think uh, people have you know. I, I've got a friend. We'll call him Keith, and Keith <laughs> is. A bit of a Nazi when it comes to his backyard. He's got like 20 grandkids. Well, he has three or four cars parked there, but he's really strict about it. I mean, it looks like my guy, that guy, had to be in, enforcing all parking. But then just a couple houses down, you got somebody that's just driving in, and it's just and it looks like crap. So how do, how do you do something? Clean up one guy without hurting Keith, or do you just hurt Keith to clean up the other guy? You know what I mean? Um, but I, I think it's okay to have a gravel pad or a gravel uh, driveway into your backyard. I'm okay with that. And so for clarity, you're okay with it in the rear yard, but you'd still like the side yard to be paved? Uh, again. The side yard, so the the next to the, the house or next to the garage behind the front facade of a of a house. Would, yeah. You want that gravel or you want that hard yes. surface? Well, no, wait. Yes, I would. Gravel or hard surface, sorry. <laughs> gravel. Gravel, okay. That's my So question on the fire code deal so is that violate from the if it's on a, a pad on the side or the rear is that violating any fire code uh, the fire code that specifically talks about the fire access routes is really more for commercial industrial property um, it was just the term of all weather uh, that was causing issues so if we're talking and just about residential zoning right now for side and rear yards we can get by with doing gravel there and still require the the hard surface all weather um, that the fire code requires in those instances and this is residential that means multi housing units as well as single housing units right uh, multi-family residential uh, depending on the size of the development would then click in some of the fire codes depending on how big that development is uh, so there would be uh, some coordination we would need to make but if it's going to be considered a fire access road it would not be allowed to be gravel I might interrupt him. Yeah, I was going to invite the uh, acting fire chief. Thank you for being our acting fire chief, by the way. Uh, Christopher Cross, I'm the deputy chief of the fire department. I, for uh, clarity's sake, 
uh, if you're if you are saying the word residential, I would like you to think one and two family uh, structures, like a single family house or possibly a duplex. Multi-story, two to three story uh, apartment buildings are garden apartments, are uh, large in size and would be considered uh, commercial buildings due to the size of the building. And we also apply uh, fire access road uh, provisions from the International Fire Code when we're, when we're dealing with the layout and a pr uh, plan approval process for those buildings. Does that make sense? So the question related to that. On the north side of town, there's a lot of, I'm going to say, refabbed larger homes that have been made into multi-unit housing. Now, is that as commercial? That's a single family. That's a single family residential structure that has been subdivided. And the, the structure size and construction and where it lives within the city, it's a single family residential building. However, it's been uh, subdivided into apartments. What I'm referring to when I say multifamily or commercial, it's the apartment complex that has a center core hallway, fire protective stairwells, that sort of thing. It has to have fire, fire access roads. Because and, and just kind of reviewing for this whole thing, on the north side of town, you drive through the, like the alleyway and you'll see a lot of gravel yeah. pads in the rear mm -hmm. of these. Even though it has multiple multiple occupancies, well, underneath the roof, the fire department still considers it a residential building. Your Honor, if I may. You may. Heather, I, I have to disagree with Councilman Ladihoff because there's some loopholes in this about side yards being gravel. I know of a house right now that's on a corner, so its side yard is a street side, and they basically they have a gravel driveway in the back of the house off the side street, but they have now graveled their pretty much their whole side yard. And so now you're, we're leaning towards allowing that. And then under this, if someone buys a house now and turns it into a multi-residence structure, they can gravel their whole backyard as a parking lot? So to answer the corner lot question first, um, also on this page, we've got some definitions that we're working through. Um, on a corner lot, there's enough in our zoning cord code that would not allow it consider both of those essentially a front yard um, for the gravel issue on that one um, as far as uh, allowing somebody to gravel their entire rear yard it's a concern and it's not a concern right now that's addressed in in our zoning code um, that's something that we can put some language together to try to restrict that um, but what may restrict that is going to be one of the next items I talk about as far as how many vehicles would be allowed in the rear and side yard I appreciate that thank you thank you your honor your honor yes go ahead I'd just like to make a comment I think if we allow too much graveling we're going to be encouraging people to be uh, hoarding things in their backyard which I don't think is what we want to do so I'd probably um, be in favor of requiring a harder surface or the permanent surface of the gravel or the uh, concrete or asphalt uh, and of course having everybody go through the normal permitting process okay. any other council comment before we open it up to the public um, my my comments were uh, gravel to have a pad or something like that no I'm not in favor of of doing a whole backyard or anything close to that uh, I think you can only cover so much of the surface of your lot anyway can't you the I have a question for you. Uh, let's, uh, let's handle first the council things, then I'll open up to the public. There's restrictions about how much you can do in your front yard. The backyard has probably a little bit more flexibility that seems like we probably would be wise to put in some restrictions so that a backyard could not be fully graveled. Heather? Yeah. Isn't there somewhere in here written that your main driveway, you can have whatever cars you can fit on it. If you do a backyard or side yard, you're limited to two cars. That's correct, and that's the next item that I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of. Yes. Yep, you're allowed to park as many on a hard surface front yard as you can, but our current ordinance only allows two vehicles for a combination of side and rear. So a question related to that, if this is, so we'll go back to the big houses on the north side of town that they made into multi-unit housing. Those clearly have more than two houses and two cars in the rear. So is that a violation now and that's going to affect that housing? 
that is a violation right now. And that's why, like I said, when we came and had that list of 360 some properties that we say have a violation that we are, that, that includes that when they've got all these vehicles in the backyard. So how does that relate to every resident has to have a parking spot type deal? Obviously there's lots that are gonna be able to accommodate more cars than others. Um, if a landlord is taking their single family residence and, and turning it into four apartment units and they only have room for two vehicles in the front yard driveway, then they need to be parking on the street for the rest of those vehicles if they don't have a, a valid side or, or rear yard driveway. Does it, Heather, doesn't our code require that uh, landlords provide off street parking per unit? For new, for new builds, yes, but not not on old ones. There's grandfathered ones in. Your Honor, yeah, and this is this is the big concern. I'm speaking for Mike and I. First Ward, we have all these houses, these big old grand houses that have been split up, and you know it's it's a whole new world now. It wasn't just one family car. It's like every teenager has a car. So I understand the need, but I also understand, you know, getting up and having to switch your car every day. And then plus we have a 24 or 48 hour rule, the car can't sit in the same spot. Um, I don't want to see the backyards turn into parking lots. Um, and I hope what Councillor Schneider was saying is, you know, we wanted a hard pad in the backyard, but again, the, the gravel lots in the back would be grandfathered in, correct? A uh, gravel a driveway would be grandfathered in. However, there'd be no reason to grandfather in the rule of a, we already have a code for two is the max number in the backyard. So if they have a gravel pad and they have 10 vehicles in their backyard, they're not grandfathered in on that piece of it. All right. We have set, you're right, we have more than 364 violations then. Yeah, I, I was going to say, it doesn't take much of a drive on the north side of town to see like at least four vehicles in the back, mm -hmm. you know, not in a big line, but if you look at the uh, facility, it probably has four residents yeah, in there, tenants. W w tenants real easy, and they probably have one car each, all in their parking spot, back through the alley. I think, I think what I'd like to get after is, I know of a house uh, over here, probably on North 4th or 5th Avenue, uh, that the it's, it's just a single family house, and it's probably got 10 cars in the backyard. Um, you know, it's like, you're not parking them there, you've got a junkyard going. And that's what we need to, you know, that if you're going to use your backyard, because some of these lots and stuff like that, they're not like they were laid out in the 1960s or something. My lot is 60 foot wide, so you have very narrow, you can barely get two cars parked in front of it anymore just because of the width of the driveways and that. So we have to be a little bit flexible when it comes to it, um, but we have to be fair. Uh, you know, are you doing this under the best of uh, intentions or are you just going to fill it up and we can't have them fill it up. That's just the way it is. Honor? Honor? Uh, uh, let me uh, hold on just a minute, Mr. Kell. Mr. Mitchell, go ahead. I would presume that would have to do with uh, boats and boat trailers too as it considered a vehicle? Yes. Right. Mr. Kell, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Heather, is there a way, we, we know an ordinance revision takes multiple readings and or, or could take multiple readings to get through. Is there any way that uh, we leave tonight with consensus that effective March 11th or January 1, go back to some historical date that we don't have a lot of people rushing to quarries with it being nice out and dropping some gravel somewhere and say, well, I'm grandfathered in and just <laughs> perpetuate that problem into the future? I could only enforce it to the date that the ordinance became effective. So at this point, um, in my memo, I included uh, the potential quickest uh, timeline would be a first reading of this ordinance, March 25th, a third reading, April 22nd. So it would be, you know, the end of April um, before we could make something effective. However, I say that, but I, you have to realize that our driveway permit right now doesn't allow gravel in the backyard. 
So we have a conflict in our ordinance and what our driveway permit says, and that's one of the reasons this is coming forward to you. Um, I will say, uh, I think it was last week, uh, we had a gentleman uh, stop in and request for a driveway or a parking pad in their backyard. It is off a gravel alley. It was reasonable, and I permitted it because the code says that that's allowed. Now, if somebody came in tomorrow and gave me a permit for an entire backyard of gravel, I have technically a code that allows me to deny that request. Now, is that right? Is that fair? I'm trying to be the fairest that I can. Um, obviously, we have a conflicting code, and that's why we're in front of you tonight to get clarity so that we're able to enforce it equally across the board. Your Honor, I have an easy way to solve this problem. I just thought of it. Let's just eliminate all the alleys, and then we'd have no problem with backyard parking. You're out of order again, Gary. <laughs> We're putting your picture front and center on that kind of deal. Gary, that's like picking ketchup on a major right. Uh, <laughs> since we're, we're approaching 8 o'clock and you need direction, um, why not this? Uh, you've proposed in your memos here um, what you think ought to happen. Um, would you like a motion to uh, have you bring that back and uh, an ordinance form for us at the next meeting? I can do that. Uh, maybe let me touch upon just a couple quick. I'll try to move them quick. Um, uh, the item was not having more than two vehicles, including licensed and operable vehicles, recreational vehicles, and trailers shall be parked on the side or rear yard of any single-family residential property. Vehicles in excess of this number or not parked on surfaces meeting the requirements of this section are subject to penalties. Um, so that was the item that I, I wanted clarity on is if there was any uh, desire to change that because that is an obstacle right now on several properties because there are many properties that have more than two vehicles in a side and rear yard. And maybe council wants to keep it as two, but I before we enforce it, I want to make sure you guys believe in it. Anybody wish to uh, uh, revoke that? Well, we're, we're, I think, back to what I was seeing on the north side of town in these big old uh, single unit houses, single residences that have been made into multi. It looked like they had a very clear designated parking space off the alley in the rear. It had the railroad ties or whatever it looked like they had to stop it, but they had more than two vehicles in there. So are we going to... An existing... Is that going to be grandfathered in? Is that... Uh, how is that? I mean, we don't have that many big old... Uh, houses on the north side of town, but I would say if you look, a good share of those have been refabbed into multi-tenant housing. So the only thing that I can think of uh, to allow something like that is you could add language in here um, that if a single-family residential property was split up into multiple units, you would be allowed a maximum of X number of cars per unit in the side and rear yard. I just would like your direction of what that number would be. We're going to have to because, I'm so sorry, Your Honor, we're going to have to, Heather, designate multifamily units because I know I can think of a place right now that they've got uh, five apartments in a two-story house, and now you're talking about putting those five cars on. They have no front driveway, um, so their parking is on, you know. So you're talking about putting five cars in, on the street. Um, We've got to figure out something to differentiate a single-family home as it is today and then criteria for what Greg's saying about a, an existing apartment house. And I don't envy you on this one. This is tough because, again, it's just the nature of the beast. The older houses on the north side were single-family homes, and now they're not anymore, and so parking is a premium. Okay. I would propose 1.5 vehicles per unit. That Any objection? Very to me. I mean, that seems like that, it, Greg Nichols, that seems like what, if you go the width of most of those lots, that seems like that'd fill it a nice single row pretty nicely, and you don't have the big multi row junkyard in the back where they have, you know, 25 vehicles stuck in it. I don't think very many big houses are getting cut up anymore. I think they have been, but I think. Uh, I think most of them are, are, have been done if, if they were going to happen anymore. So we're just mainly going to be dealing with the owners of the current, um, what we're doing. Okay. I'm um, going to. So you sure had a problem with yeah, this? Uh, go ahead, Ms. Go. 
Yeah, I think that's a slippery slope to comment from Councillor Wadi Huff. Um, we just did a massive rezoning of our community. So just because it hasn't been done recently doesn't mean it won't happen in the future. Um, and it, that needs to be part of the calculus of uh, a property owner if they want to split up a house. We, we, we can't change our rules because they're, they're choosing a path um, from an existing house. That, that has to be part of the total evaluation. Thank you. And I was going to say in Iowa City they had significant problems in the campus town with older homes like that, and they actually started to buy those back and incentivize people to turn them back into single-family homes to try to alleviate some of the parking problems. But uh, uh, so you've got that on the you've thrown that out 1.5 per unit. Uh, do you want to get consensus up here about that while we're at it? It's just a discussion item at this point, so it's coming back for you guys for. Additional review. Uh, with that, I'll move on to the next item. We've had a request to consider allowance of a parking pad not connected to a driveway be allowed in a rear yard to allow for seasonal or temporary parking of a vehicle or trailer, such as a boat or an RV over the winter. Is there any thoughts um, or input to allow? Your Honor, I'm okay with that because that, that's your, you know, your two vehicles in the backyard, so... Yeah, I, I think that's the bigger issue we have outside of the, the, the vehicles that are being used. The next issue is trailers and, and, and motor homes. So I'm okay with that. So I think the way that I would do that is it's hard to enforce, right, whether it's seasonal or not. I mean, I'm going to throw a number in there like no more than moving it off that pad six times a year. Um, obviously, if it's creating ruts, you can tell them that they're moving it more than six times a year. Um, but what this is going to allow is I know we have some residents in town right now who park their fishing boat in their front driveway because they don't have space on their property to get a driveway to the backyard. Now, their neighbor is willing to let them drive over the grass to park it there for the winter, um, but they right now can't do that because it's not connected to a driveway. So I think I'm hearing consensus. I'll uh, write it as such, and we can discuss it next time if there's additional things. Lastly, um, as we talk about snow removal and the snow ordinances that we have, um, there was an idea to suspend the yard parking requirements or restrictions within 12 or 24 hours of a snow parking ordinance in effect. In other words, if the snow park parking emergency alert ordinance goes out somebody can drive the vehicle and park it on their yard not on a concrete pad um, to get it off the street if they so choose now hopefully the yard is froze and it doesn't cause damage um, but I know I, I hear from other communities who have a citywide band. If the snow emergency goes into alert, everybody gets off the road. And I hear, you know, stories of people just parking in their front yards and everything, and, and that works for that community. Um, we hear comments all the time of people who work outside shifts, and they struggle to have that change over time. And so in our way, this is our offering um, to potentially make that work for those uh, individuals better. And I don't think these would be the yard parking complaints that everybody's complaining about now. It's strictly when there's a snow emergency and alert. And obviously they're going to need to take their shovels and shovel their front yard a little bit to be able to get their vehicle parked there. Um, but I think that's an offering that I think city staff were supportive of, if council is. And hope the next snowstorm doesn't come right after that. Wouldn't have much of a problem this year. We couldn't even keep the ice skating rink open more than four days. Um, any reaction to that one up here? Because I'm getting cognizant we need to get public input here too. Uh, Your Honor, I, I, I think the only thing I'd say is I think we'd be sending mixed messages if you can park in your yard sometimes but not others. That'd be my main concern. Understood. Any other council comments? Well, let's see what uh, you come back to us with next time, and let me open it up to the public. Yeah, I got a question for her. My name is Jimmy Lant. I live 610 North 4th Avenue. I've been up here many a times trying to get, get a permit to add on to my garage. 
And I was denied two or three times from uh, Michelle. Spons uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but Michelle, she denied me two or three times. I just wanted to put like another 20 foot on my garage. And she told me I couldn't do it simply because I didn't have enough yard space. That the codes of Marshalltown required you had to have so much land in a in a house for a yard. So that's why she turned me down. So what would be the difference between all these parking lots? I apologize, I don't know the specifics of that, um, but I can ask our planning and zoning department to uh, clarify that and bring that back at the uh, first reading of this ordinance to clarify what, what our current code says regarding that. Your Honor, if I may. Right. And Heather, will you ask too that I think that falls under a variance request that, you know, by posting, because you're talking about setbacks, right? I mean, would you at least ask that and find out? Because I'm not sure if it is or not. I, I, I called another question about whether it's remain or not. I thought we were just talking about parking oh. here. That's a garage. That's an addition to a structure. Different question. But I think staff can answer the question. I would answer it if I could. I'm, I apologize. I don't, I don't know the answer to I, that. I didn't expect an answer tonight. And, and we don't want to waste everybody else's time to do that for this individual who has left. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Dave Grieve, 24 West Main, part one. <clears throat> um, I used to live on a downtown apartment right down on Main Street that was made into apartments and there was parking off the back alley, which worked fine. <clears throat> and I know that a person moving into this town, I am struggling to find any place to live. And discussion prior about these lots you're letting out um, I'm trying to find a place with a garage because I need a garage and my guy got toys I need a garage and is there any opportunities like lots you're trying to get rid of that it's like you could give a tax abatement so that you can develop it I mean I'm looking at one rental property right now and they got some sort of tax abatement to come in and build these places to provide housing and we got all these lots that need to be refurbed and done but you can't I mean if it sounds like there's more rules to try and get something done than it is to come in razz it and put something in there um, I'm literally moving out of a state that is so high tax that I'm leaving and so restrictive I'm in a county with so much HOA rules in the county that I can't even do what I want to do on my own property and I'm right up against a freeway it's not even a nuisance so my only concern is you start putting a bunch of rules upon rules upon rules and codes that link to codes and codes there's already 15,000 ordinances in this town it's difficult to do anything that's all I'm gonna say anyone else I think staff has its direction, and that is the last thing we had on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, time is 8.08. We are adjourned.